All right, guys, listen, we're, we're waiting for a few last minute people. But in the meantime, while we're waiting for them, this is like a sort of a pre-intro to the class, which I'll play, I'll play it here. You guys see some scenes. But let's, if anybody's really interested in, in the nuts and bolts, the, uh, the nitty-gritty, let's come over here. Let's get around this. And this is not the class yet. This is just, but it's all getting recorded. You guys can always watch this. But come over here, and, I, and some of these things I'll be referencing so you'll know and understand when uh, when you're, as you know, the older guys have been teaching you guys since you got on the forest that in case of fire, don't use the, and there was a reason, okay, the reason why you don't use the fire escape is because you know where fire escapes have been uh, controlled by, they've been controlled by the IBC, and it's, we're celebrating 100 years the, that the IBC has controlled fire escapes including its maintenance. And after 2012, did they finally say, hey, when it comes to maintenance in the IBC, it says, you know what? Go we'll see those guys over there at the IFC. <clears throat> so what's the rule? The, a lot of it is about money. A lot of it is about inspections and costs and who gets budgets. So imagine for 100 years, none of the fire escapes in all of California have ever been five-year inspected. We got a couple of these one years, we're going to talk heavily about these one years, but let's talk about what it means. So, what we have here is we have connections that if you leave them alone, it takes about 25 years to grow a quarter inch of rust, but it takes 50 years to grow a half inch of rust. It means you have to leave it alone, don't touch it, don't do anything. So, not only you, you have not inspected it. But so the owner hasn't done anything about it. And so what happens is when you get those and they start looking like this, look at that rust in there. I'm a cardiologist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, with the Farscape proctologist here. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, what happens now, you're concerned about what's inside here. Well, what's inside here is what's inside here. It's Nothing. fat on this side, it's fat on that side. You can still see the head, you can still see the nut, and what do you got in the middle? All right, so you can even use these as pencils. You can use these as needles. Uh, but basically, you're looking at what happens inside here. Now, this is when you guys are going up and running up a fire escape, and you step on that tread. She does what? She does the separation. And so whenever you're stepping on anything, or anything is re relying on resistance of some kind, so even a through bolt into the building, this is what keeps the whole platform on a building, from it not to pull out, you let water come down here in between the bricks and the rest of the, the masonry. It rots out. You can't even see that. But you see it peeing out and this rust stain coming down the whole building. And there's a big nut. You look at it. Oh, that looks pretty good. But this is what finally says, I'm done in it. So I'll be going over many cases. Cables. Some of the cables that you have holding up all your weight boxes. They look like this. And what happens is, it's nothing but little wires to create, but then when you start getting and, and rust and water and, and uh, rain and, and ocean salt will work its way in there. And so, but if you keep it painted, you'll think it's great, but it's not. So we're gonna keep on going through what happens to material when you eat it. In order for me to grow a quarter inch of rust, okay, the fire escape needs to give metal up so it can make rust. So in order for me to get to this much rust, I need to eat the metal. This is what deteriorated metal looks like. So as it starts at a quarter inch thick up here, it may go down to one eighth thick here to make rust. And so this is iron when you just let it rust. It, it basically, it just expands. So almost like what? Like spaghetti? You know how you put spaghetti in the bowl and it boils and all of a sudden spaghetti gets fatter? This is what happens. Okay. So in order for this to give... Can't get wet. Can't get wet. Yeah. <laughs> right. So here's a bolt and the shaft is gone. So when you step on it, what happens? So this is why your firemen are scared. Yet behind us over here, you guys are training on fire towers and what do you have on there to train with? That you already been told not to go to. So for a hundred years, IBC has controlled it. 
Finally, in 2012, they said IFC should now maintain it because IFBC builds things nationwide for 100 years. IFC was supposed to watch it once it got built. So what's supposed to happen is IBC, you build it, you pass it, it's all good. Now you hand it over to IFC and you guys watch the, the lights, the, the batteries, the monitors, the, the egress, the, everything else associated with an existing building. So this fight behind, back and forth, the one bastard child of egress has been fire escapes. And they've just relinquished activity on it because this is what this is all you have to do in IBC. You must maintain your fire escape ready for its intended use. 100% of the time. So it's a purely voluntary request of the owner to maintain their fire escapes. You don't have a five year rule in California till 2012. And that's when the IFC got adopted. And then the state not only adopted, now the cities had to adopt. The state, without putting your fingers in there and changing a few things or whether or not. So right now, in California, the only city that has a one year and a five year, which is an ordinance, not even a code, way before the code was apl applied in 2012, was San Fran. They have the 604 and the 908. The 908 is the one year inspection, and they want you to test the fire escape system. So anybody can inspect the fire escape system. As a matter of fact, in California, uh, in San Francisco, uh, any of you can open up a, a ladder testing company without any license. There's no license for it. And there's only three guys up there. And you can basically walk the fire escape system, and then you can grease it, change a cable. But there's only, there's only one on the five-year, which is the 604. The 604 must be done by a design professional. But they don't say design professional. They say general contractor and pest control contractor. Because back in the day, what did you have more? Steel or wood? So why, now you understand why the pest control guy, because it was the termite and stuff like that. But right now, the five years pretty much done by structural engineers and architects. And what are they looking at? They're looking at the code issues on the fire escape structure, and they're looking at the structural adequacy and to see if there's anything inside. So what happens is a lot of times clients will give you They'll paint the fire escape before you ever show up. And so when you show up and look at it nice and painted, you say, looks like you've been maintaining your fire escape. But when you turn it upside down and certain people can look, you can see that the connections are missing. There's internal rust inside the connection. So if you don't know what to look for specifically, that's the difference between a dermatologist who says you, don't have, you have some skin rashes, and a, and a cancer doctor that says you've got internal bone, you know, you've got internal cancer with the bones inside. So we are basically looking, the five years going inside, the one year is dealing with the outside. And as soon as you do the, the five year, what happens is the five year already does a one year. And then what we do is what we do for the next four years, and we have confidence tests fresh off the press. You guys are getting the first ever five year confidence test to basically be submitted to Bricer, because Bricer already has a one year. If you go to your Bricer, Bricer's using basically the confidence test out of LA. So if you say, give me, a, give me a one year inspection, they would use the LA. And when you go from the LA one to the rest of the states that they've, they've used the one year, it's the LA model. And a lot of the questions they pulled out, I have questions from my confidence test. So I have my confidence test here, and then we have a modified version that will be suggested from San Jose to say, hey, we'd like a one year, here's a five year, here's our, here's our two questionnaires. Your fire escape must have a five year before we let one year be inspected. So five years inspect for code and structural adequacy, one year test the system. Make sure everything's working. They climb up and over the ladders, come down the whole fire escape, come down to the ground and they release a ladder or they release a cantilever. And they do that every year after a five year. So one year, five years, Four more years of one year, then it's another five year by a design professional, structural engineer or, uh, or an architect. So this is what we're going to be talking about. It's not what's on the outside, it's what's on the inside. Now, this, I'll just tie this back in and uh, we'll start the class and that is the IBC. So Fire Escapes have been built since 1870, East Coast. 
and then they started making their way west coast. Okay? By the time they got here, you guys actually have one advantage. You started galvanizing your stuff before. But not all of them. But the majority of Farsi started getting galvanized when they got put back up. So that's one great protection. I gave you the 40, 50 years. Because uh, that's a, already a protectant. But they, they didn't have any mandatory five-year inspection rule of any kind. They, the, they, the IBC basically stranglehold everybody so that they, put, they made it a voluntary requirement for you to maintain your Farsi. And they also, they never codified it to say, no, no, like the, like the elevators, I know they're working. Prove it to me again. Like your sprinkler systems, I know they work. <laughs> Prove it to me again. Why? Because they're critical to life. <laughs> in that situations that are going that are going on there. So that's what we're going to really cross the lines today. And so the IBC is basically uh, the the ones that have held it for 100 years, and not until 2012 did it apply. You guys didn't adopt until 2015 or 17 in the state. I don't know if San Jose already has it as the 1104, the five-year rule on the 1104. So if San Jose hasn't adopted, so it's in the state, but you know who does care? The insurance company. Because they're saying that if it's a state requirement, a lot of their bigger buildings, so you have a choice. Either you wait for San Jose to adopt or whatever the situation, I don't know how you guys do your fire codes, if you amend your fire code, so that if there's a San Jose fire code, or you get you basically take it as a blanket, whatever uh, California. California has put it out. Uh, uh, Alan, you know uh, more. It was 2015 or 2017 that they adopted uh, the state of California. The state of California. I think it was 2017. All right. And then uh, we just have to. Not all the cities adopt it, adopt that section. Or even need to adopt it. Sometimes yeah. it's not even it's not even a question. You, if they the state wants that, that's what you guys want. Okay, so that's the things that we're going to be covering, some stuff you have to do in the back end. If it takes too long, then just create an ordinance. To speak with your mayor, speak with your, your counselors and say, hey, we, want, we need an ordinance here that says, like San Francisco, we want a one year and a five year. Everything's a five year and everything's a one year. Okay, so any more other people showing up? So I, it was important and, and throughout, at the end, so today's game plan is you're going to watch a video for the, till 12 o'clock, you're going to have a one hour break, check all your texts, make all the calls, save all the people and all the fires. One o'clock, we're going to come back here, and then we're going to go and check out the fire escape right behind here on your tower. You're going to do your first inspection on a fire escape. I'm going to teach you, you don't have to walk them. You're never going to walk fire escapes again and put yourself in danger. There's enough from opening up a door on the, on the 11th floor of any building, looking out and telling and seeing the situation from the ground. The first and second floor will tell you everything about the fire escape. Okay? But then, and then we may have some, I, some locations that we can walk to later on this afternoon. And that's again, hands on, we're just gonna walk. And I'm not gonna inspect, you guys are gonna just look at what you can write for violation. It's very simple. Must be structurally sound, must be kept painted. If I can prove to you that a fire escape rots from the inside out, right? And the fire escape is all brown, you get to any brown fire escape, what's the likelihood of internal rust? So you don't, need to, you don't need to get on it anymore. And it's a third party inspection. You don't need to tell them that there's a tread that you're concerned about or a rail that you're concerned about. You just say, hey, must be structurally sound, must be kept painted. This thing is brown. That means you've ignored it for 15 to 25 years. That's how long it takes to get fully brown. And then you say, uh, and you're, you're going to write the one violation because here's the violation that was written by the IBC. In case, uh, whenever they walk up to a building and the fire escapes were built in the 1920s, five years later, what did you need to do to a fire escape to keep it maintained? Scrape and paint, right? So they would write on any violation, it was so standardized that they would walk into any violation, I need you to scrape and paint your fire escape. Okay? What you're going to write from now on, I wanted you to inspect it, repair it if needed, and load test. So we're going to talk about load test as the last piece. What is a load test? Because uh, 28 North First, did they choose a full refurb or they choose a spot repair with possible low tests if required by the city? So let's talk about what, the, what a scrape and paint was. If you wrote a scrape and paint in the 1920s or you wrote a scrape and paint in the 1950s, what does it mean? The owner gets scrape and paint the fire escape. 
which is a routine maintenance if you've been maintaining your Farscape and there wasn't either a 50 or a 100 year gap of where you just like sit back there somewhere. So imagine Farscapes in California, they were back there somewhere you guys have never looked at. So scraping paints work when there's routine maintenance. Scraping paints don't work because it's non-structural. So the scraping paint started this way. They wrote scraping paint in the 1920s, they wrote scraping paint in the 1950s, they wrote scraping paint in the 2000s, till today, assuming that the people who are getting these violations are going to inspect it, repair it if needed, and load test it, and then paint it. So they would put out a bid, a typical three-story or five, uh, let's say a three-story fire escape, typical, right? So they would put out the bid, a scraping paint violation that you just wrote, I put it out to bed, I called Joe the painter, Joe the painter comes up and says, hey, I need to paint this fire escape. He says, the terrible threes, ready? He says, $3,000. But he also says, hey, got a couple of loose treads up there, you should get those fixed before I paint it. Guy goes, okay, I know an ornamental guy down the street, let me call him. So he calls an ornamental guy, and he's, he's, he's not able to do it, or a welding guy, they call it, you know what I'm saying? And he comes out and he goes, hey. Dude, it's not just two treads, you got like 11 treads, but I'm going to do I'm going to light up my welding machine, okay, illegal, can't weld, because this is a moment connection, allows you to wiggle, move, earthquakey, and as soon as you weld this shut with all that rust inside, as soon as you say, oh, I can fix that, and you weld it, but you leave that inside, this is still growing, 16th every two years, or every year, or every five years, whatever. What's it do to a welding rod? So bolts stretch, which they do, and welds snap. They, they can't take any force. It'll just snap. So, so that guy comes in and says, uh, and by the way, because he's trying to steal the job from the painting guy, we already gave him a three, I'll do that for $13,000. Crazy numbers here. Three here on one hand, I got 13,000 on the other. I can be calling a professional. Like us. Right? And like us means there's a lot of other people out there that are very professional the way we do. They say, you need an inspection by a structural engineer or, an or a design professional. In walks Alan. Alan checks and looks at the fire escape and he identifies all of this. He identifies you know, some of the connections. He identifies material that it has eaten through and he has to replace it or sister it. He identifies, you know, welded connections that are holding things and, you know, and, but it's a crap weld. It's a field weld and any field welding needs special inspection. How many special inspections have you seen anybody call for on a fire escape? So, and he says, you know what? We got to separate these connections, put in new bolts, <clears throat> replace any worn material, including the tread clips and whatever. And on some of these welds, to avoid a load test, just drill a hole through it and put in a bolt. Keep the weld, just give me a new bolt, because now the bolt becomes the master and the weld becomes the slave. Okay? So he does that, and all of a sudden, the price comes up. Puts it to a professional ornamental company that not only builds these and repairs these, 33000 The guy goes back and he says, oh, let me take a look at this. I got a violation from you. Scrape and paint. It doesn't say inspect. Repair if needed. Well, he will tell me if it repaired. He will tell you whether it needs to be repaired if needed. And then it says load test if required. Well, if I change all the bolts, the NFP already covered that. The authority having jurisdiction shall accept by load test or other evidence of strength. So you load test old connections that are in good condition, no, no rust inside. But if you change all the connections, there's no internal rust. You got brand new bolts. Is there any need for a load test? Or is that considered other evidence of strength? That's considered other evidence of strength. But it doesn't say that in IBC. It doesn't even say that in IFC. Because you got, until you put the three together, you don't get a picture. So with that, the guy says, violation, 3,000, 13,000, 33,000. Calls the, the paint guy back. Says, hey, I want to give you the job. Gives the guy the job. The guy does the job. He goes, what about those two loose threads? He goes, can you take care? He goes, yeah, I got a cousin who welds. And he'll weld those for me. And so the job gets done for uh, 33000 They take it and they just paint it beautiful and black. And because he didn't write inspect 
uh, repair and load test, there is no there's no testing process. He just gets called, hey, it's done. So he basically says, okay, let me go out and look at it. He looks at, at it while it's still tacky, wet, and black. Does he want to climb it and get a suit? Dirty? And when you look up at this, doesn't that look beautiful? Black and painted? He doesn't get to look underneath it. And he says, okay, he removes the violation. In some cases, he'll say, and this has been going on for 50 to 75 years nationwide. You guys are the last ones doing it now. Because thank God you had some galvanization that occurred in between there. Um, he says, send me the bill to prove that you did the work. It's almost like send me the plumber bill that says you took care of that plumbing problem. Send me the electrical bill that told me so I can remove your violation. He doesn't even go out to inspect. He gets this bill painted a fire escape at 123 Main Street. Looks good. Removes the violation. It's good. When you guys go to fight a fire, <clears throat> boom. Because paint is not structural. So you're not new at this. You're the newest at it. But this has been a common practice for a hundred years now. And that scrape and paint has been the violation right up from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast. Scrape it and paint it and I'll remove your violation. So now when you say inspect it, it says that right in the code. The 1104 says you must inspect the fire escape, finally. And you must submit a report. Well, they used to say low test. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna soften that up to see which one of you guys were asleep at the switch. But what is report? I don't know, let's, let's put all three together again. Let's go back a few years when it said, our case must be examined and or tested. Oh, well, what's that mean? See what that's see what that's going? So as they soften it up, and there's a lot of political push, <clears throat> blowback, but the key is what do you know? And what does the insurance company know? So the insurance company says that if somebody signed up on a fire escape with internal rust, somebody goes to court. You know who doesn't know? A lot of times doesn't go to court? It's you guys. Because you have so much, you can only, you only pay out so much. And they're really looking for deep pockets. But a lot of times when somebody did the incorrect inspection, they're really, look, they're really trying to hang an architect, they're really trying to hang a painting company or whatever, because they didn't take care of the internal rust. Okay? So that's what we're going to be today. So today is touchy-feely day. These are the very same pieces that I bring to court cases. I'm an expert, expert witness. They paid over, over $100 million to the people that represented it in the cases that I've done nationwide. My latest case was just up here in San Francisco, just settled a month ago. And uh, Alan, you remember the one that's basically, it's a hole in the middle of a deck with railing. This is about, about the size of the, of the deck, uh, just a little bit hair longer, but with a, with a three-way ladder. Well, they have railing here, good. Railing back here, good. Railing over here. Good. No railing over here. So if you didn't have common sense to go towards the, be the beginning head of it, you could literally fall down the, the unprotected part. Because any hole has to have how many, how many sides to it? Cover. Four. They had three. She fell through, landed 18 feet down below. She's got all kinds of brain damage. Uh, you know, and they, they settled out of court, primarily because we said, in this hole you needed to have four side. This needed to be extended so that they leave a 24 to 32 inch opening, so that in case she even fell in that, she'd fall into the ladder parts. You know, like oh, and she'd be tangled up. She wouldn't be dead. A broken finger or a broken limb, but she wouldn't be dead. And she didn't actually actually survive, but you know, she was a lot of brain, and uh, she was just 40 years old. So, and my first case ever was a fireman who fell through three sets of stairs in New York City. Severus Pine, 27 years old. Uh, but, you know, he saved the woman up on the fourth floor. But the, when the adrenaline wore off, he basically had broken his back. And, and it All right, so that's, anybody else you guys expect in the class? No, so I...
our chief can't make it, and we have one inspector who has an event he's doing right now. Well, we got video. I'll say, yeah. We did do this, and we do have information. We do have video, and that's the key. The key is once the knowledge is in. See, you guys already know all this stuff. Because you can apply it to other things you are familiar with in your house, on your cars, on your trucks, on your structures, on your wood decks. You're like, oh, rust and rot is kind of the same. Structural adequacy is the same. Height of rails is the same. Fire escapes, they're the bastard child of egress. But the key is, once you understand how it works and what, how, it wor how it gives up of itself, now it's easy for you to inspect. And now you'll be able to easily identify a fire escape that has, it's newer, because it'll have hex heads. An older one will have square heads still on it. And then you'll have the rivet ones, which are the oldest, and they'll be almost 100 years old. So there's the three things. Just by looking up, just took a look at the type of bolts, you see whether they've been routinely maintaining, and that means internal and external, or if they have just been using the, we call them the paint witch doctors. And then we also, and their cousin, the welding witch doctors. This is why you've been told never to use a fire escape. But once you get this under in control, I'll guarantee you within the next five years, fire escapes will become a major training part of all new recruits to say, get on these, they're safe, they have a tag on it that says they're safe. We now have full confidence, and you know what kills people in, in most fires is the smoke, not the fire. So they can get out and self-evacuate is very important, but you guys need to get in. Because right now you guys don't get into fire into buildings through the fire escape. You guys go in and put your tanks outside and go through the front door. Imagine being able to get now have the confidence to say, I'm going to climb this stair, I'm going to penetrate at the fourth floor, which is not on fire, but I still have my tanks in case there is smoke. So it's all, you know, that, that's how you fix a problem, you know. Fire escapes came in, into real play in the 1920s. But then very quickly they invented sprinkler systems. So where did fire escapes take a... They took a back seat. Why? Because they went from saving people to saving buildings. And in the process of saving buildings, it let people get out. Oh, we're going to get you out sooner. We've got water spraying on you. And, you know, what about that fire escape? Yeah, IBC's got that. You've got you to maintain those voluntarily because, you know, very quickly we're not even going to use those ourselves. But when all hell breaks loose, guess what you guys jump into? The fire escape. And let's start our class. The last piece that you guys are going to freak out about is a lot of your fire escapes have standpipes. Yep. And OSHA says, as of 2017, that you have to have a, a certified platform to work. So you know how many sprinkler systems cannot be done now because the fire escape is not certified? You had a question? I did. I was wondering, uh, how, did, how do buildings get sold since insurance companies are drivers? How do buildings get sold that have fire escapes and have them be Because you were driven, um, you were driven to utilize the the horns, the smoke detectors, the sprinklers. You know what I'm saying? So that we, you know, it's like a parachute on a plane. How many fatalities using a parachute were you hearing about? You know, nobody complains after a parachute fails. <laughs> You don't know what happened, so it, became, it fell out of favor. But right now, the insurance companies are aware. I've taught this seminar to insurance companies. And guess what they're, guess what they're getting? They're getting to say, so Cisco, in the past couple of years, uh, how, many, uh, how many dollars have you cost us? And it's over a hundred million dollars. <laughs> so now, I'm also an expert witness case on a fire escape in, for Los Angeles. The city of Los Angeles is getting sued because somebody got electrocuted on a fire escape for $50 million. So when you're going to get sued, you know, there's going to be a knee-jerk reaction. But what you're going to have right now, you guys are going to use today's class to basically say, you're going to put yourselves on notice, you're going to put the building department on notice, and you're going to put the city on notice. That says, we have this, we need to have a program in place and let the people be non-compliant. Question? No, I just wanted to add to what you were saying. You were asking about uh, city ordinance and code. So, uh, California Fire Code has word for word the International 
on fire escapes in Chapter 11. Five year? Yes, and then in our city municipal code, it's, it says that Chapter 11 has been adopted fully by the city of San Jose. End of start. Since when? Since, though, this is 2016. So are you guys are only three years out of compliance. <laughs> So what do you need to do? You need to work with your city, uh, your city uh, uh, solicitors, uh, and you know how you send out a tax, a tax document to uh, you know pay your taxes every quarter. You need to slip in. I had a city do this to basically put a line in the sand. So write this down. You have a city solicitor or the city tax or the city clerk send out a letter saying we've just been made aware that the requirement for all people who have fire escapes which could be either steel, wood, or cement. So, I don't think fire escapes are only. So, all exteriors, egresses. So, let's not call them fire escapes anymore. So, all exterior egress, which make up your second means of egress, whether they be steel, wood, or cement, or a combination of thereof, including fire escapes. So, Put fire escapes at the end. And you mentioned second means of egress should be in compliance with the chapter 1104.16 as of 2016 when adopted by the state. Please submit to us your latest inspection, otherwise order one immediately. You know what happens when the city sends out that letter with all the text and they do it four times that year? So I'll do it in four three-month cycles. Letter, because you're going you're gonna to piggyback the, the postage. It's just a letter. It's a standalone letter that the fire department says, have this out. Three, uh, three months later, have this out. It's part of your taxes. Have this out, because everybody. And please disregard if your building does not have fire escapes. But some of these people who own buildings that don't have fire escapes, what do they own? They own buildings that do have. So we can help you craft that letter because now you want to mention rear decks, rear porches, uh, uh, older hotels that basically have these outside stairs and these outside platforms. They're all supposed to be load tested and inspected because they're the second means of egress. Right? So we'll work with you guys on that, but, but, but by having your clerk and your solicitor put out that letter, you just put a line in the sand that says, now it's on who to, to, to get it done? It's on the tax, you know, the people who are paying tax for their real estate in your city. And they, the phones are going to ring. You say, yep, all you have to do is just, you know, just start getting your fire escape inspected. Oh, I, I'm going to have a guy, I'm going to paint it first and then I'm going to have it inspected. Nope. You must write this down. Every violation you ever write, you must inspect, repair if needed, Load test or other evidence of strength. As soon as you write that's the only thing. You don't mention treads, you don't mention rails, you don't mention anything on your violation other than those four points. You think you're going to get a call for clarification? So they're going to call you and say, hey, you wrote me a violation, man. This is unlike anything I've ever seen. In the past 30 years, I've gotten scraped and paint violations. I don't understand it. So inspect. What do you mean by inspect it? Yeah, design professional or others acceptable as part of your code, right in the code. Design professional. So I only want structural engineers, registered architects, or others acceptable to the building official that have a specialty company. That's this, so the other is in there, a specialty company, to inspect your fire escape. And I need a copy of the results, not only for you, but I need a copy of the results for me. If there's structural issues, I want you to <coughs> have a report generated that the vendor is going to bid off of, so that's repair if needed, under the control of who? The inspector. Why? Because he's the guy that's going to sign off, so you, you think he wants to be part of the whole chain? The permit process is very simple. For a hundred years, if I painted my door, did I need a permit? If I, if I changed the frame of my door, did I need a permit? If I painted my house, did I need a permit? So guess where fire escapes fell? Under routine maintenance. That's why the painting doctors and the welding witch doctors have had a free-for-all for a hundred 
years. We're not going to fix this in a hundred minutes. We're not going to fix this in a hundred days. This will take three to five years for you guys to get this, this onion unraveled. But it starts with one step. A lot of times it's your downtown, five to ten story structures. You start, the word will start getting out. This letter from your, by your clerk, getting it out, takes the liability off. Because somebody three years from now is going to get hurt. And they said, oh, the city does nothing about this. And you're like, wait, wait, wait. We sent you a letter four times in 2019 and in 2020 stating that you're three years out of compliance. And you didn't respond, or you gave us some some story. We, there was a process, and now that we were aware, we made you aware, and you didn't do anything. Huge! Everybody's just like, oh. And we already have a program. It's in this third year, of, you know, working it out. We have a five-year inspection rule. We have this one-year inspection rule because we were relying on voluntary. It doesn't work. So now these people have to pay somebody every five years to do a full structural that's going to cover uh, at structural adequacy and code violations, if any. And then the one years are basically, they're going to grease the wheels, grease the cables, and they're going to walk from the roof go up and over, you know, as, as a test drive for our firemen. It's not our firemen they're going to do that. They, they have to walk up and over, come down the whole stairs, check all the doors, make sure all the doors look good and that they're functioning go down to the lowest level and release the, the, the system to the ground twice. You guys, you guys gonna have confidence in your fire skips after that? Oh, by the way, put a nice big white tag on it that says this fire escape is safe. <clears throat> put a yellow tag on it while it's under repair. Put a red tag on it when it's out of compliance. It's scaffolding. Yes. All right, so. Uh -huh. So, so do you guys understand the this this uh, this? So a lot of this all just makes common sense. You already know this. The fact that I'm just going to give you a different way to look at it. You already knew. You can apply common sense to it from other things you already do with smoke hoods, with sprinkler systems. You guys already have a common sense. But the sprinkler system is the craziest. It's still attached to fire escapes. And OSHA says that as of 19 as, uh, as of 2017. You guys know that the next big problem is the whole rooftop issue with the, with the, uh, the tie-offs, you know, the anchors on the roof and the roof inspection? You guys have been playing with that yet? Oh, let me throw you that one. Ready? Uh, <laughs> so, so if your plate ain't full enough, here's the next course meal. OSHA decided to let you guys know that as of 2017, January 1, they want nobody on rooftops that are not harnessed. They want all rooftops cordoned off with, with railings so that if you are going to go up there without a harness, there's a protective six feet from the edge. And why is that? So they came out in 2017 because they spent 25 years writing this law. I was at a class, teaching a class in, in Baltimore, and it was, a, it was a, a, another guy teaching this class. So I was part of the class. After I taught my fire escape class, I was listening to this class. And I have a whole page on this. We can, I'll show you guys the page, but that's the next piece. And what it is is that anybody, it's primarily for the guys working with uh, you know, uh, window washers and all that other stuff, anybody hanging from a rooftop, you have to have a, a five-year inspection on a roof anchor all around a, all around a building and five-year pull, 5,000-pound pull with one, uh, with one year inspection. Is it five-year or ten-year? I think it's five-year with one-year inspections, you know, verifying that it's all there. And then they said, and we'll, let, we'll give you some time to implement it, you have till October of 2017 to fully implement it. How are you guys doing on that? <laughs> Write that down. So that's your rooftop requirement. Well, back, back to sprinkler systems. The sprinkler systems now is a major chicken and egg problem that you guys have, now have. Because the sprinkler guys do the five year or three year for you guys? Five, they do the one year or the three year, you know, the, the one year. So OSHA is a code, and it's part of this code, and I'll tell you why this code came to be. It took 25 years. They did a 10-year study. They had over 10,000 deaths on new construction or existing construction being remodeled. On, 
existing structure being remodeled. Because the guys that go up there, they don't have cables, they don't have any harnesses, they're fixing stuff on roofs, they're falling off roofs, they're falling off of buildings, they're working without any safeguards. They had 10,000 deaths. You know how many deaths they had just for new construction in the same time period? 100. And they said, Jesus, this is crazy. You know, we, but they took 25 years thinking this through. And so what they did is they put the, they put the, this ocean did one thing that's really got everybody scared out there. And that is they put the liability square on the owner of the building and or the management company managing the building for the owner. So if an owner, if I walk into a building and I have to go to the roof and play with the elevator and I don't bring my full harness or the roof isn't cordoned off with a railing six feet from the edge and something, somebody gets hurt, they're in OSHA violation and it goes directly to the ownership of the building because the management team let that occur, let that death occur. So they put, the, they put the liability back on the ownership, which they've never done. You know, it's like, oh, the insurance company, nope. It says clearly, when you get to the top of the roof, check out some of your buildings. There's a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a, a, a plan of all the, har uh, the harness tie-offs. And if I jump that rail that's over six feet from the edge, I have to harness off to a 5,000 pound, and I have to go examine the gutter, because people are getting blown off roofs with gusts. People are up there like not paying attention. They joke, come on back, yeah, ah! <laughs> they're falling back. <laughs> 10,000 deaths. Taking selfies. So, taking selfies. <laughs> so, uh, so what happened was, um, back to the sprinklers, you guys have a quandary now. There's an inspection next week on a fire scheme that's not certified. And it's either your five year or your ten year. And these guys are going to be crawling all over it, and they're going to be in violation. If that fire escape gives way in any way, they're going to be in violation. How can the city be pulled into it? The city's going to get pulled into it because you're supposed to tell these guys, where's your, you can't perform. So you tell your sprinkler guys, you can't perform your sprinkler test until the fire escape is certified. So if there's a planned fire escape inspection, what do they need to produce to you before they can get on it? Certification of the fire escape. So it's, they're going to be the deputized sheriffs, because who's the first user year after year of a fire escape out of all the people? Is it firemen? Is it vendors? It's sprinkler guys. Have to go there and, because a lot of times the fire escape holds the sprinkler or it's tied right next to it because that's the tie-off. Okay? So there's another twist for the sprinklers. And again, you guys would be, you have the code to back you up. It's not like, oh, this should be a great idea that you guys, you know, be on safe fire escape. It's regulation. So we did that big guys today. You know, just, today you know what you know. So just be on notice that you know now how do you push that notice away, you write a letter, you write an email. Because it took a hundred years to screw this up. Guess what you're not gonna do? You're not gonna fix it in a hundred days. You're not gonna fix it in a hundred minutes. But you guys can fix it in a hundred seconds by writing an email, say, I've learned this. You let your your ups know it, have your ups talk to the city, let the city let the, the populace know, then guess what happens? Now let's fix it. We're doing our best. We gotta get faster on it. Great. Then we have to outsource it to third party, more th third party people to come in. Because this, we, we've ignored this for 100 years. We, you know, we, we can't. We either need more money. So now in the city of Boston, right, what do they have? Every time I submit a certificate, it's a $100 fee. So I don't know if you guys wanna have a fire escape fee that can be uh, strictly associated with the running of this program. Because you can do this over the next three to five years, and in the next three to five years, when all the fire escapes are back online again, you can just eliminate that fee. So a special assessment, do whatever you need to do to create not necessarily a task force, because it'll work, it'll work by itself, but you're going to need some extra manpower. So usually we designate somebody in the room as Rusty. I think we designated Rusty last time. Who's going to be Rusty? Was it you, Captain Rusty? 
Yeah. Somebody, I think it was him, and our, we had a meeting, it was Captain Rusty. Okay. And so you need one guy that is the, the fire escape liaison. And what happened is that one guy just basically, he has, he reviews all fire escape activity that's going on. So no matter whose violation is written, no matter the building department is dealing with it, or one of you, everybody has their own sectors, everything sort of goes back to Rusty to make sure that the fire escapes had, had fulfilled the fundamentals of no internal rust, scraping paint. And, and then he also will be coordinating uh, with the sprinkler guys to make sure that if they're going to be submitting, so think about this, every time I submit a five-year certificate to you from a sprinkler guy, what must I also submit? A copy of the fire escape affidavit. So they, there's a task force, because you know how many buildings get well, it's a better question. How great are you guys at having every building in your city sprinklered and tested? You guys as close to 100% as possible? 90%? 75%? So if that's 75%, right? So the fire escapes are going to catch sprinklers. The sprinklers are going to catch fire escapes. But these 75% that are already in compliance, already have this sticker on it, already going through the process, they're going to help. They're going to be bringing in all kinds. Because it's just a new checkbox for you guys. Do they notify you guys that there's a five-year coming so you can witness it? So you got to notify them to say, listen, we'd like to witness because Bricer asks for you to witness certain examinations. So you guys got to check out Reg 4 out of L.A. because everything can be witnessed. Doesn't mean you show up, but everything that they have to give you 24, oh, you just recently passed the test, what's that, 24 or 48 hours? 48 hours before any fire protection system is getting tested, you have, to reg, uh, reg, you have to notify Regulation 4, which I highly recommend you guys copy in its entirety, you know, and get rid of the crap. That, but they basically, it's a money maker, you see. Test costs, to, be, to, have, to hold my license there, the test costs a thousand bucks. Every three years I have to renew it for five hundred bucks. They test everybody, so you have to have a special license, it's a Reg 4 license. If I'm a sprinkler guy, if I'm a you know uh, you know smoke detector guy, if I'm a fire escape guy, anything to do with fire protection is controlled, and so that's a money maker. I don't know if it goes into a general fund or not. I don't know what this, but you know what I'm saying you guys, you guys, they, that's how they they made their money. It's increased it to 1700. 1700. Think that so you must inspect, prepare if needed. No, no. All you write on the violation, inspect it, repair if needed, low tech. Low tested or other evidence of strength. We're going to cover all those. You guys ready to have some fun? Now listen, there's two ways to be great at this. So if you guys, you guys are like unicorns. I've taught the, I, I teach primarily fire prevention all over the country. You know why? Because fire escapes kill building department or fire department? Fire department. Got it? So. So I'll be teaching the first fire, fire escape class to architects at Las Vegas on Thursday. Then I fly back over here. So this is what I do nationwide. So I've taught classes from Maine to Florida. And they're online. I'll show you where to find them in a second. And I've taught from uh, Chicago to uh, Texas. And I've taught from Seattle to San Diego. This is the first San Jose. Now uh, what you're getting here, and this is why it's important that you interact with me, that you challenge me, that you talk about what this is, because I also have a master's degree in reverse stupidity. That means not only do I know how to do it right, but I know more ways to do it wrong and to bamboozle you guys than you can ever imagine, because I've been in this business since my dad, who's 82 years old, still works in the ornamental field doing railings and window guards today. He wants to die with a welding rod in his hand and a... And I... I have been focusing on fire escapes in the past 15 to 20, 20 years, but I've been at this since 1971, guys. Look good for 92, but that's a different story. Uh, <laughs> but do you understand? So you guys, if you guys interact with me, challenge me because if I tell you that there's rust inside here, you'll forget it and you'll never believe me. If I tell you how rust grows, You'll never forget it. It's like when somebody finally taught you about wood, that if you don't protect wood and you let water get to it, it 
rots. So whenever do you put up a pine deck? You don't. You put up a PT deck. And how do you extend the life of PT? You stain it. <laughs> so what hasn't this ever got me? No love. Any love? This is the bastard shop. So challenge me, ask me, ask questions that pertain to you as inspectors, ask questions to pertain to you if you are firefighters, you know what I'm saying? Because some of your firefighters are not here, and ask questions if you were the bosses, you know, the captains, the fire marshals, the city, the city planners, the city, the city mayor, and what kind of liability. So some of these suggestions I'm making to you is a line in the sand that says we know, now you know, now we can step back and say we do, you do something about it because you own the property. We just inspect it. Got it? All right, so let's talk about fire escapes. Can save lives or take them. That's it. So they're, if they're fully functioning, fully cert uh, certified, fully painted, when people have a fire, it's made for them to egress out and get, and, and get themselves out without your assistance. Got it? So that's the main thing of a fire escape. Now, what's it also made? It's also made for the firemen when they get there to ingress. Okay? Because if the front lobby is on flames, what's the only way you're going to get people out? You got to climb up the very fire escape, and you guys they air it out, right? You know, you got to stop smashing windows so that you can get some air in the place, right? So this is ingress. And this is where that other fireman, see these three treads? If those three treads gave way, which it did in New York City, my very first expert witness case, he fell from there, fell over here, went back up, saved the lady, brought her back down, okay? And then he realized that he broke his vertebrae and that he was 27 years old, out. But the one thing that was great about that case is that he sued the owner personally for neglect, and he won. And why was that? Because this wasn't an accident. This wasn't an industrial accident. This wasn't a work accident. The guy had ignored the fire escape for 25 years. This was an accident that he triggered because of his, the other guy's neglect. As soon as you've got neglect, what do you have? You have a direct case. You have a liability. And he won. Two and a half years, three years later, I went back to look at this fire escape and inspected it. And the place was filled with lawyers and inspectors. And I'm just doing it, and you know what was 100% certifiable? Those three treads. You know what was not? The rest of the fire escape. And that's when it settled. It's like, you, you boobs don't even know what you're doing. And they quickly settled. All right, gentlemen. Um, as you can see, firemen. Let's talk about load testing. Okay? Because the authority having jurisdiction shall accept by load test. That's NFPA. It's in your book. I got all the codes there for you. IBC, IFC, NFPA, OSHA. If you put all three on the table, you can write any violation any day. Because somebody's going to push you away from the IBC. Oh, you're, you're kidding. Okay, then you go to the IFC. Oh, you go to the NFPA. Oh, you, oh you're an OSHA. <laughs> you're violating OSHA. So pick one. So they're either going to violate all four, which is usually the case, or as they bop you around, it doesn't matter. They're in violation of four codes that only when you put all four on the table, it makes sense. Because nowhere in the IFC or the IBC does it say, oh, sprinkler guys, you can't certify the fire escape. I mean the sprinkler system until the fire escape is certified. You try to look for it. It doesn't say that anyway. But OSHA said it. So as soon as you overlay all these codes together, one sort of references the other. Load testing. Come by the hats. What year is this? 50s? 50s, right? So if, there, if most fire escapes in the U.S. were built by factories in the 1920s, because it was mandated, it was a code requirement in the 1920s, Factories everywhere built every fire escape you've ever seen, right? So, and then all of a sudden, when they fell out of favor, you guys know that you can't build new fire escapes now, right? So, fire escape. When somebody says to you, you can't build, 
because you're not code guys. So right now you can't build new fire escapes, but it's only a 50% statement on new construction. On brand new buildings where you dig a hole in the ground, I need a stair inside here, I need a stair inside there, and I need an elevator here. But on existing structures, a big old church mansion, and I'm going to turn it into four condos, guess what you can build on it? A fire escape, because when you walk into this mansion now, where's the, st where's the staircase? In the center. Where's it go? All the way to the top. Like a chimney. Has a glass top on just to light up that beautiful stair. And there's four condos to the left and four condos to the right. Guess what you need? A second means of egress. Can you use the, the butler's and the maid's old fire escape? Or, or the, uh, uh, the, that hidden staircase in the back? Can you use that as second means of egress? So now you need full fire escape egress on the back side. So on this mansion that you're going to get, that you're probably going to review plans, can you build a fire escape on an existing structure as long as that structure is up in the air. And you've exhausted all means of putting it inside. Oh, let's throw some more, more code at you. You, you're, you haven't done a change of use, and there's also you haven't hit the level one, level two, or level three, you know, uh, uh, work prescriptive. Renovation. Uh, renovation. Renovation. But that's okay. Aside from that, can I build a fire escape on the backside? And it's historical. Let's throw one more pinch in it. It's historical. Can I put a fire escape on there? Yes. 75% of the time on an existing structure that is being renovated and saved for whatever reason, can I build a fire escape on the back to satisfy the means of egress because there's only one internal stair plus an elevator? The answer is yes. 25% of the time, I can't. You know why? Not because of code, not because the building inspector doesn't want to hear it. So that's the factor. Even though code can prove you can, the building inspector, who is the warden, he's the, the big cheese. He says, I don't want to fire escape out there. End of story. I don't care if you have to knock down the church. And it's a historical whatever. So just be aware, you can build new fire escapes. All right, so here's my little test. Fire escapes are built to 100 pounds per square foot. Does that look like a 5x5 five five plus minus? Right, so 100 pounds per square foot, that means in the 1920s till the present day, the fire escape is built the same way. There's no changes. The structural piece outside, and then it ties through the wall inside with either the through bolt and a plate or cemented into the, uh, into the building eight, uh, uh, 8 to 12 inches deep. It goes through the veneer and it goes into the building 8 to 12 inches deep. Common sense, right? So let's talk about the load testing. Because some states have gone crazy with the load testing. Portland. <laughs> and I've worked with them for 15 years. So you guys are getting the, you know, the best of the best, but there's stuff out there you guys cannot have to copy because it does. Guess who wants the 200 pound load test on a fire escape? Fire department or building department in Portland? Building department. Why? Because they've had it for 100 years and, and now that they've given it back to you, they're like, well, we'll give it back to you, but. We're going to make up some new rules and, yeah, should load test these things for 200 pounds and then walk out the door. Like, what do you, so let's, let's use common sense to load test this thing. Got it? 5 by 5 equals 25 square feet. It's, it was fabricated and rated at 100 pounds per square feet. So 25 times 100 is 2,500 pounds. So if I ever, in a common sense load test, will I use sandbags, water bags, and I have video of us load testing, so if you've never seen one, I've got that silly show on my on the videos on my on my pages. Okay, 2,500 pound, 2, pounds of sand or water, correct? Or plate? Common sense? Somebody got it a different way? Walk an elephant through it, or have a fireman sit up there and go like that? But the three of us will help you out. There you go. <laughs> so it, so it should be the maximum you're going to put on that building so that you don't affect the wall is 2,500 pounds. Sounds good. Because the wall also has a, a, a division of uh, how many brackets. So if the brackets is every two feet, there's a different pull on the wall versus every five feet. And most brackets are every five feet. This has all been thought out in 1920 when they built walls and how thick, because it's usually a brick veneer going through a, a two, if not three, if not four coarse masonry block wall on the inside. 
Common sense? So we got 2,500 pounds. I got 10 people in this building who were here before these guys showed up. And 10 people, each one of them, they're kind of chunky, they're from the East Coast, 150 pounds a piece. Every single tenant, child and moms and dads, they're all 150. And we got 10 evacuating right out of the top, and I put 10 people in that 5x5. Five five. Can I put 10 150 pound people in a 5x5? Five five? Well, some of them are they're doing the piggyback thing. Okay? So let's, let's, let's add a little bit, right? So I've got 10 physical people squishing, and anybody that didn't fit got on top. 10 times 150 pounds is how much? 1,500, but it's rated to what? 25. So I got an extra 1,000 pounds in there. And they, everybody comes down the whole fire escape and they leave. You guys show up. Every one of you guys is 200 pounds, plus 100 pounds of gear. There you go. There you go. 300 pounds, and I only got five of you coming on this thing. So five 300 pound firemen. How much do they weigh? 1500. How much more pounds is just there in reserve? Okay. So can I get five fully outfitted firemen with gas, with gas masks and tank and everything over here? In a five by five, can I get them all? Can I get five fully uniformed guys in a five by five? Well, again, piggyback. <laughs> so with that comes in, I'm just trying to tell you, if I ever load test anything in your city, it's going to be out of hospital script. Importantly, though, if you go and read their page, it's online. The building department wants you to load test it at double. They say no, no. There's a safety factor of two. And their, their interpretation, because they've done a great job for 100 years, their interpretation, hey, it should be 200 pounds. So I'm now going to put 5,000 pounds on that fire escape, which was built only to 100 pounds. Like an F-150, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, a one-ton truck that you basically drop two tons onto. And they're like, yeah, we should. well, who said that? Uh, some crazy mechanic or salesman. A salesman said, our one-ton trucks should be able to carry two tons. And the, and the guys who built it say, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> so in Portland, when I did a 200-pound load test on some of the fire escapes, guess what, what failed? The fire escape or the wall? Or the wall. The wall. <laughs> guess what? To pay to fix it. No, the owner, because I'm following the building department's recommendation on a 100-year-old structure to double up the load. So if your building department gets their hands on this and they say, load test this fire escape like Portland, because I have a cousin in Portland who was a, fire, who was a building department guy, and I want every fire escape in your city load tested to 200 pounds, I won't perform any of them for you, because it's, the results is catastrophic. So now I, we load tested the fire escape pass, but the wall, poor guy's wall now is buckled. And who's going to pay it? The guy is. I just, I, I just, I'm ready to sign off because I fully refurbished the entire fire escape. And if you, go to, if you go to NFPA, it says the authority having jurisdiction shall accept by load test or other evidence of strength. So I presented other evidence of strength. Guess who said to load test it? Because the fire department was totally cool because they went to my classes in Portland. I've done 15 years with the fire department in Portland. But the building department said, what? All by his loans himself. Yeah, I know you fully refurbished it, but I still want you to load test. And it gets even crazier. So don't, get, don't go crazy on this. I'm, I'm going to move, move on. They don't want you to load test 100% of the brackets after I fully refurbished. They want you to rep load test 20% of the 100%. So if I, have, if I have 10 brackets, they want me to load test two of them somewhere, and if 10% of the 100% fail, I can still certify it. Who made that up? Fire department guys or? The building department coming in and said, I know we've held this for 100 years, <laughs> but we're not done yet. So guys, if anybody ever refers a 200 low test, oh, you know where this came up just recently? I don't even remember this. I was in Yale University 
last week inspecting a fire escape on a theater that's over 100 years old. And guess what the uh, engineer in Yale says he wants his fire escape flow tested. So when I got there, this is a true story, Yale said, uh, our, the engineer for Yale would like you to low test the fire escape first. That is. Fix whatever breaks. <laughs> and then paint it. And I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> I said, correct steps. I said, but here's the process. We're going to do a preload test evaluation. We're going to identify any internal rust. The surface rust doesn't bother me. That's just the paint. Did I mention EPA has told you that there's lead paint on this? And if you get caught scraping and painting this without an EPA renovator's license, you guys know what that is, right? Uh, it's a $37,500 fine. And that's because you're burning it. And if I, if I weld it, is that burning lead paint? That's a $37,000 That came out in 2010. So the welding witch doctor is just not happy. Because a lot of their work went away with EPA and lead paint. So to, to, uh, I walked those guys through. I said, listen, it's very simple. Preload test evaluation. I had three contractors there that were getting told to do this 200 pound load test. Let me explain something to you. So, like this class, I, I gave a 15 minute version of the class, talked about internal rust, and I said, um, preload test evaluation, identify any internal rust, repair all internal rust, and then load test it in its entirety, or a spot load test, or an integrated load test on what never got a bolt. Because if it got a new bolt, it's integrated, it's already, it's already other evidence of strength. Anything that was left, I'll load test that only because it still has its original bolt. Otherwise, you fully remove all the bolts, there is no load test. Because you have to repeat this every five years. But if you refurbish the fire escape in its entirety, you can carry other evidence of strength forward for 15 to 25 or more years. Okay? And why, why is that? So let's, let's go back to common sense, and then we'll finish, we'll finish with the load testing question. What happens here is the common sense uh, uh, approach to uh, the repairs of fire escapes, a lot of these guys are getting into the repair using welds. An opinion affidavit is what they would give you, and that's what you've been getting here in California. If anything did get touched on a five-year, it was an opinion that had a disclaimer that says, to the best of my information, knowledge, and belief, the fire escape is ready for its intended use. Is that a low test? That's an opinion. And uh, a lot of times they would add, today. So that if the accident happened tomorrow, what do they say? It wasn't today. It wasn't today. Golden parachute. So let's uh, let's rock and roll for it. So what th what this also means, guys, is that 200 pounds is not going to work. Between Oregon and Yale, we can debunk a few things. But what it truly means, we've done the calps. You would have to have people two feet square, over 10 feet tall weighing 600 pounds a piece. That's for you to just achieve the 100 pounds per square foot. If they want 200 pounds, then we are, are putting two foot square people, 12 feet tall, weighing 1,200 pounds a piece. That's what you're load testing for. So does it ever make sense? Will that ever happen on that specific part of the fire safety? So the other sense, so common sense and practice should prevail, but when the building department and the fire department, they get in and there's one state that has it, and they're my best state. Their program is 95% of what I'm going to teach you today, 95% of it is they adopted. But then the building department guy came in, he was just pissed, because <laughs> that wouldn't go away, you know what I'm saying? Don't no problem. <laughs> but no, 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 that makes, I don't care. <laughs> We're going to make sure our firemen are safe. What firemen? Elephants? Clydesdales? What are you guys bringing through these fire escapes? All right, I'm about to move on. Are we clear on load testing? Are we clear on other evidence of strength? So what do you carry in your pocket? When somebody says, I fixed my fire escape, the guy was here. And the welding guy, and he did or did it without permits, and he's 
and he's got he's going to call the city attorney and his high-powered attorney is going to call he's, he's just raising a ruckus and he knows somebody and he plays golf with somebody else you know those kind of people what do you have in your pocket that is in the code the NFPA says the authority having jurisdiction shall accept by low test or other evidence of strength is the guy giving you satisfactory other evidence of strength if he just painted the thing and wiggle waggled it and say okay cool Low test. I'd like to be there when you low test. Why? Because the code says I can. Where's it say? Where's that state for you in the IFC? It says in the 1104. Uh, an inspection shall be performed and a report shall be submitted. What's that report? What report to you means what? An opinion affidavit or a low test? What's report mean to you? Because they took test out of the word again to soften it up. What's report means to you? Where do you keep that? So you get anybody that's an asshole, excuse me, the French, what do you pull out of your back pocket? If they're doing it right, you know, there's no internal rustling. As soon as they got welding witch doctors, you know, and, the, and the, they, they clearly violated the EPA, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and so what do you pull out of your pocket? Okay, no, I'll take, the, I'll take the certificate, no problem. Let me know when you're performing your little test. Like, whoa, what do you mean? Look, it's in NFPA. It's in the IFC, and if you want to look at it, it's in IBC because it says that you must, that there's, a, that there's a, um, it's a reference to how it was built, and it must be tested. It must, it must, it shall, what's the word? It shall uh, hold the 100 pounds. Design, uh, design to. It, it's design, it shall uh, hold in the, the design of a 100 pounds per square foot, which you can interpret if you want to like, you know, because I'm the Rosetta Stone of, of fire escapes, right? So they wrote it in hieroglyphics, they wrote it in Greek, and then they wrote it in, in uh, you know, Sanskrit or whatever that final language is. But until you really get it in front of you, what don't you get? So you need to know all the codes that are available to you so you can say, which, the, which one of these did you violate and all which several of these did you violate? But in the back pocket, what do you have? Load test, which also means report. Yep, just whip out your low test trump card. Like, yeah, 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 you're an asshole. Okay. Low test. Now his four aces mean what? <laughs> I powered lawyer and I, you know, I gave money to the mayor for re-election. Alright. This happened in, in Boston. and a firefighter's line of duty. But Chief William Hitchcock remembers the night it wasn't the fire that almost stopped him. Who oh, escaped to death? <laughs> but the fire escaped that broke underneath him. We just came away from the building. And our investigation found across Massachusetts more unsafe fire escapes. Rusty, deteriorating, crumbling, broken. And what state officials didn't know, the system they set up to keep fire escapes safe is also falling apart. The potential ramifications are disastrous. So let's look at this one. This expert iron worker is licensed to build, maintain, and inspect fire escapes. So they are repaired? For months, we examined dozens of them with alarming results. Looking at this today, would this pass inspection? No. In dormitories, at theaters, at homes, and apartment buildings. Rust is actually eating away the metal of the right. fire escape. Right. And the bottom line? It'll get weak and then eventually it'll fall. This one has rotted connections. This one, missing bolts, twisted metal. Would the stairs come down? No, never come down. This one, a broken tread. So how dangerous is it for the people inside this building? This fire escape is definitely going to put somebody either in the hospital or it's going to put somebody in the air. In the cemetery. Fire escapes are so okay. critical. The state building code requires they be certified for structural adequacy and safety every five years. But our investigation found that safe Our state is IBC. Ignored. And we have a five-year. Here's proof. We chose fire escapes at random in Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, Worcester, and here in Quincy. We checked building department files. But there's no fire escape certification. To see if building owners had submitted their mandatory inspection reports. There's no certification in this way. 
bottom line, not one we checked in Quincy had been certified as safe. And the Director of Inspectional Services admitted because of staffing shortages, the city has no idea how many other fire escape owners are breaking the rules. And as a result, do you know how many fire escapes in your city are safe? Or not? Well, I don't know. In Worcester, not one we checked was certified. In Somerville, or more fire escapes. The fourth of the Not one up-to-date certification. And again, no system for keeping track. How can they get away with it? Well, I guess the, the shortest answer of all is because we don't have the resources to sit here and follow up on these things. If structural deficiencies are reported, local building inspectors can actually evacuate residents until repairs are made. Would you talk to us at Chairman? Scaffolding. No, but when we surveyed oh, yeah. two dozen more communities, most admitted they had no idea how many fire escapes were certified. In Taunton, inspectors told us they haven't seen a certification in 25 years. Northampton officials said, it's a cold day in hell when that happens. The official in charge would not come out to discuss it. In Boston, where there are more than 8,000 fire escapes, again, according to inspectional services, not one we check was certified. Officials know they are required to enforce the building code, but they admit they don't always know if owners are breaking the law. The building code is being ignored. Right, but it's difficult to write a violation when you don't have knowledge of something like that. But state officials say for a critical issue like this, communities should know. And they warn the Massachusetts building code is not optional. Does it worry you that these fire escapes are not being certified? This is an important issue and should not be ignored. That's because after the smoke and flames begin, It'll be too late to learn. Yeah. You've got no way out. I can't stress it enough, Hank, that these things have to be maintained and, and someone's got to be watching. As a result of our investigation, state officials... The fire guy giving a quote about what the building department's not doing. If there's a fire escape on your home They've or office, hostage you can contact the local building years. department to make sure it's properly certified. In the newsroom, I'm Hank Oh, Hawaii. Not too long ago. It's only 2003. You notice the hair? The hair's down back then on me there. But guys, this is why it happened in 1973. So every now and then, uh, the building code can change, and it's usually a tragedy, a death. And as you can see here on the first picture, this picture won a Pulitzer Prize. And what was it? It's a fire escape where a fireman was saving a woman and her niece. The fire escape collapsed because the through bolt rotted out. Right? The firemen grabbed the ladder and saved themselves from the fourth story. Talking about how scary is that? She fell, the fire escape landed on her, and the, and the niece landed on her aunt. That happened in 73. This happened in 2003. What year are we in? Ask me how many classes have I taught to the state, I mean to the city of Boston. How many classes have I taught? None. Ask me how many classes I've taught to the uh, associations of building inspectors in Massachusetts. That includes every other city, and Boston is part of all of them. So there's MBCIA, the Samboa, Midwest, you know, there's four associations of all the local building inspectors. And I've taught continuing ed classes for the past 15 years. Guess who's never brought me in to teach a class? Because Massachusetts is an IBC state. And even though the I-11-04 uh, came in, the IBC still took it back and said, nope, we've got it in our IBC. So still referencing IFC, but say, we want to keep it in. So who controls inspections in Massachusetts? It's still IBC. I put my name out to the fire prevention. It's in the same building. It's one floor below. Guess how many classes I've taught to the Boston Fire Department? None. Guess how many classes I've taught nationwide? Hundreds. So, is there political? Yeah. Is it stupid sometimes? Yeah. But you know who pays the price? And then all of a sudden there's a lot of thumping, chest pounding going on. So just recently, 2014,
The guys were fixing a fire escape with a welding rod. And I think I have a piece here. And it killed two firemen in a blowback. Because they caught they welding the fire escape outside, caught a shed on fire. 60 mile an hour winds that day blew the fire into the building of the neighbor, five-story row house. They went in and started smashing windows to ventilate with 60 mile an hour winds coming from the backside to the front side. Two guys in the basement knocking on doors saying, get out, what did they die of? Fire or inhalation? And I call the, the, you know, the secretary and, I, uh, and, the, and the public safety and I told them I've done a bunch of classes and I'll do another class and guess how many public safety classes I've taught for the state? It's a great, I'm zero for zero. So guys, just realize, it took a hundred years to screw this up. You're not going to fix this in a hundred days. And you're going to be just starting the crawling. You're just going to start crawling because you're going to be more resistance than you can ever imagine. But it'll take you three to five years to get this going because you're going to connect the dots. You have all four codes in front of you, plus a fifth code, which is the EPA. But you have all the codes in front of you, and you also have the sprinkler systems, which protects people, it protects buildings. So if I own a building that's a 15-story, do I care about the people? Or do I care about my building? Insurance companies care about the people or care about the building? Because what's cheaper? Replace people or replace buildings? People. Easy. There's a couple of million, sorry that you died, you know. It's great. Something happened, I'm so sorry. A building is a hundred million dollar project. See the shift? So if you know the backstory, you're going to be able to go forward with it. So this, and this happened right after the Station Night Fire where 100 people died in Rhode Island. And she says, I want to do a class with you. And I, 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 want, to do a, I want to do an interview with you about how, you know, about fire escapes and that people, whenever there's a problem. So she was doing a fire story. Like, you should get out on fire, you know, get yourself out and be, always be aware, like an escape plan. Do you know that 75% of all the fire escapes I examine fail? And out of those 75, 50% of those 75 have life-threatening emergency, missing treads, missing the... She goes, no way. And that's when she did that. So I walked her around, taught her a few things. She went off on her own and she wrote that piece. So why do you think Boston doesn't have it come in? Yeah. <laughs> why doesn't Boston like whistleblowers? Right, so that's when that was written. Since then, I've had a few more people come out and say, Sister, can you do a few? Let me tell you some of my other cases going on. Attorney Cabrera says the victim felt 12 feet and had multiple surgeries. 
The building eventually settled the lawsuit for millions. You got to live with pain for the rest of your life. According to the Department of Buildings, there are about 200,000 fire escapes in the city, and they are all required to be maintained by building owners. In building six stories and above, fire escapes and building facades are inspected by the DOB every five years. We have a limited number of inspectors in the city. We do the best that we can. And they were clearly concerned when we showed them some of what we found. This is a clamp. How do you feel about that? It's only the fire escape together. That's a technical condition. So what about in situations where you have clearly rusted out parts? The new work violations for failure to maintain. Scrape we run into those conditions. This year, there are more than 5,311 complaints to the DOB, as well as the Department of Housing Preservation and Development and the Fire Department, who also does regular inspections to make sure firefighters are safe. If you feel a fire escape is, is dangerous or, or unsafe, we don't expect our members to, to go home. The Fire Department says they will put up ladders or find another way in. Firefighters have been uh, seriously injured on fire escapes previously. There's a dear price to pay when an owner does not carefully maintain the fire escape. The fire escapes on some of their buildings can be 75 to 100 years old. Our expert told us that some of the bolts holding them up have never been replaced. If you see a dangerous situation, call 311. I'm Marcia Kramer, CBS 2 News. So, for the next one plays. So that case, it's an eight-story building. I'm the expert witness now on that. They were doing a facade inspection. You guys perform facade inspections on anything over six stories here? No? So in, in, uh, in the East Coast, they, every five years you must scaffold your street. You must perform a, a, a scaffolding inspection. I'm sorry, a facade inspection. But sometimes you don't clear the street. You, when you start working on the facade, you put, a, you put the scaffolding down. And so the inspection was a female uh, of the firm doing the facade inspection used the fire escape to go up and check the whole structure from the front face. She stepped on a tread that was welded on a connection holding a tread that was welded. She stepped on it, she dislodged it, it came ping-ponging down eight stories and there was a guy with three kids I'm sorry, he didn't have his three kids, but ricocheted off the ground and hit this girl going the opposite direction, put her in the hospital, and uh, that's the current lawsuit I'm involved in. Also involved in another case here, which we're going to show you shortly, but these are what's happening there. How soon is it going to happen here? Very soon. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, but, take heart, if your guy gets hurt on a fire escape that has 25 years of rust, is this an accident during a firefight or is this negligence that the firefight triggered? Can you sue the owner directly as a firefighter? So not only will you get compensated if you don't die, through workers' comp, but what can you do to the building directly? Does the smoking gun be left behind the bullets? Very important information. You guys know the internal. You know the difference between internal rust, right? That's when you look at it this way. What surface rust? Well, that's when you look at it this way and you paint over it. What protects you? This side protects you because you got to clean the connection out. What makes it? What makes a fire escape look beautiful? A paint job. Who's been ruling the roost for 75 to 100 years in all of California? Welding guys and paint guys. Because who's been what? Who's been at the? Who's been at the switch? When did you guys get it? 17. 2012. But then when did you finally adopt it? So it was a great idea in 2012 that the state adopted? No? No. So the IFC came out with it in 2012 nationwide. When did your state finally say, yeah, let's, it's a good idea, let's do it? Five years later. So 
you see the origin? See why you have to know all the five codes? All the codes in front of you? That way, because who, who, who does this kill? You want to know one of the greatest ordinances you can ever write for people who have fire escapes? All cities should have an ordinance that says no rent checks can be collected other than through a fire escape stair taped to the outside of the fifth floor window. Or even better, in a Ziploc bag on the roof ladder halfway up to the roof. And only the owner can come and get it and take that down every month. That's going to be one of the greatest ordinances you can ever have. So, building guys build things brand new. You know how easy oh, yeah. it is to okay a brand new something? You guys repair and maintain things indefinitely for the life of a building. So, building department has nothing to do with that other than you have to pull a permit to do some of this work. And there's code requirements on, on the rebuild, but there's engineer oversight that's supposed to happen. You're not watching any of this. The building department's not watching anything. He needs to know this. Right now, you've been relying on the welding witch doctors and the paint guys to say, it looks okay to me, man, and you let it go for 100 years. So this is one of the means of egress things that have been, it's just a bastard child of egress. You would never think about it because it fell out of favor. You know what I'm saying? It just fell out of favor. That's all it was. It's just sprinklers came in, smoke detectors came in, you know, alarms that can see smoke versus smell smoke, you know. That came in, so as soon as you, everything starts happening, something else. Even, other, even, other even extinguishers, fire. you know, fell out of favor. You're not, to, you're not supposed to fight a fire. You're supposed to get the hell out. I think it was become a, a uh, fire escape inspector. So one of the questions that I had about the load testing that you were saying, I know that the 100 pounds is correct, but I understand that whole concept, but that's like dead load. Right. People coming up on, you know, the, what those, it's going to be live load, it's going to be shock load, you got shear load, the wall. I mean, if there's systems kind of leave it into the wall, you know, that's one thing, but if it's just, you know, dead acre to the side, then it's a different deal, right? I mean, those are all different calculations. So it's a combination of two, but it's a dead load that we do. So dead load includes the weight of the actual fire escape Correct. plus people on it. Right, but not moving. No, they're not jumping, not not coming downstairs. Well, that, but that's that, they're not going to get that crazy with it, you know. That's not that's not that. But we're telling you, there's already a factor, a safety factor in there. Sure, that's in that. That's in that. In that common sense approach to it, the saying, you know, Correct. it's like I'll give you an example. Uh, if I take your ladders on your fire truck, okay. and how many men usually get on your fire truck on your fire truck ladder? Seven stories. How many men get on? Well, we aren't going to go seven. Well, this, yeah, it's we up to seven. A lot of them will go up to seven. Yeah, no. but well, we're gonna, we have a hundred foot ladder area, but you know, basically, I, I hear, I think I. I so let's do with a hundred, right? Yeah. And how many guys get on that? So uh, on average, on every fire you've ever seen, how uh, many guys get? Three or four. Three average. guys, right? Yeah. So yeah. somebody comes along and says, you know what? We need to put twelve guys on that. Correct. Like. Yeah, yeah. He goes like, I can't get twelve guys. No, oh, yeah. The most I can get on it, using their space, and their space equals three, four feet of, you know, when a man is there, he's got to be in front of him, so nose to ass, I can get, I get six guys up there. Right. I want 12 guys. But why? Oh, because, you know, why? Let's use common sense. Are we, are we, are we, are we sending elephants up now, up these ladders? That's one thing in the what happened? You gained one pound? Common sense. No, no, no. The law needs to be interpreted oh. using common sense oh. of the day. Correct. So you have some codes that are 50, 75 years old. They say, but that, that, that doesn't apply to today because today people do this. All right, guys. Let's open it up to some questions. Because we're about to go into some more video and stuff like that, but I, I want to sort of give you a break because I can monologue all day long. But so far, what you've understood, what you've had, what, what kind of questions do you have that I can answer right now? Anybody? Anybody have a code question? Anybody have a structural question? Anybody have a rust question? What's the code? What's the uh, IFC code for the fire safety inspector? It's eleven oh four point one six. And you actually, is there a different code, Alvaro? Alfonso, 
Is there a different code for the municipal, or you just got you guys you've adopted the entirety chapter eleven? Well, we've adopted the chapter eleven entirety. So it's eleven oh four point sixteen, correct? Yes. So that's okay, so is that CFC? Yes. Same thing. Okay. Got that? So and it's been that it was adopted in two thousand sixteen, right? Yes. So you you've had this as, since two thousand sixteen. So you're three years behind compliance. Not you, because you guys already knew this. <laughs> but everybody you're violating, you can say you've been in violation. Okay? Right. Well, that's the thing. You need to have a common sense approach. Now, the first question is, um, and I'll, I, now over the next three to five years, is it like I want every single one, like Philadelphia said, ready? Because of a death. I was expert witness on that case. Three people fell. Two got horribly maimed and injured. One died. The city, five years after the accident, said every fire escape. You're a, he's a Philadelphian right there. Living in Simi his whole life, but in Philadelphia. Go oh, Eagles. Oh, okay. uh, <clears throat> but in Philadelphia, they had a knee jerk reaction. And they said every fire escape in the entirety of uh, Philadelphia must be inspected by July 1, 2017. How's that working out? And then you know how the law says very clearly that design professionals or others acceptable to the building official said, oh no, we want the, the high and mighty structural engineers only who must be licensed in our city only who must have all these credentials regarding our city only and guess who made up all those rules? Fire department or building department? Because they saw what? Permits, complications, red tape. You guys saw red blood, right? Because what usually happens? Firemen on the ground, right? So just remember that. You guys are not going to fix this. So well, you must have a program. So. What we need to do is to create a, a fire escape awareness and identification program. It's going to take three to five years. Your first step is to make any red tag fire escape functional until such time that permanent repairs take effect. And it's going to be conditional because as soon as you make it functional, is it, is it a certified fire escape? Must it be monitored while they go through the, the, step, the repair process, which could take up to a year, right? So you, you work with that people. So listen, let's make it functional, but I would like a fire watch. Why is that? Because you made it functional, but there's still some unknowns here because we, we're not able, we can't load test it, and there's not enough people fixing them yet. So we've made it so that it's functional. So we believe liability lies with who? On a functionality? Back to the owner, right? Fire watch is there to do what during the day, during the time when the building is occupied? Redirect people to a, a stairwell or a different thing. So conditional, you guys can make up any kind of condition you want. Scaffolding can be brought in. So you don't piss off the building, the owners, you don't piss off the mayor's friends, you don't piss off, you know, people who have a thousand pieces of property in your in your in your city and they have some influence. So you scaffold because you pull out a back pocket what? Look at us. Right? Because they brought in a, an engineer that is the you know from Yale. And he says, okay, the fire team is good. Here's my signature. I've been at this for 45 years. Here's my signature. That's damn good. Hey Chuck, we're gonna go play golf or what? Yeah, it's good. It's good fire team. So yeah. Thank you very much for the certification. Good. The Yale guy's gonna say, "What's that? What kind of crap is this? Do you making up stuff?" Said, "Sir, I don't make up stuff. Clearly, it says right here in the IBC, the IFC report equals low test. The NFPA says low test. And by the way, we have a sprinkle test coming up soon that I have to suspend and hold off. So you're gonna be non-compliant with that because the OSHA says that you must have a certified." Test. And, and I'm the, the authority having jurisdiction. So, uh,
<laughs> Look at that, the four aces. And the four aces are? What's your four aces? IBC, you know it. They've screwed up for 100 years. IFC, you know it since 2012, but we adopted it in 2016. Right? NFPA, Life Safety Code 101, the authority having jurisdiction shall accept by low test or other evidence of strength. And you guys can cross-reference a better code every now and then when there's, there's no clarity in, the, in your current code, right? And then you bring in OSHA, 1910.37, write that down. OSHA, 1910.37 means that you have to have a safe working platform during renovations, alterations of any structure, which could include an alternative means of egress to satisfactory to who? To you and the building inspector. <coughs> Is the building inspector ever going to use that, that staircase? Right? And so now let's clarify this thing. You get there and there's scaffolding with the bold building and scaffolding with construction scaffolding. You're like, good job, guys. Like, I like it. Looks good. Only one thing. This is uh, not an empty building. This is an occupied building. You guys are doing the top five floors, and the bottom three floors are still occupied with real people. And with that, wear high heel shoes. And guess what they can't use? So just take out this one tower over here. Of oh, actually, you know what? This, this can stay here for the construction workers, but. Uh, the best location for my egress tower is over here by the end of the hallway. And then I need you to, because you have an existing fire escape, I need you to block all access to that fire escape from the inside. So that nobody inside mistakenly uses the fire escape to get down. They know that they have a second path. I do need a fire watch here. And by the way, I want on the bottom two floors, because you have 100 foot aerials, the bottom two floors or three floors, I want a big sign that's a big circle with a... Oh, that's just to protect my apartment. But the owner is more than welcome to use the, the construction scaffolding. Got it? Question? Where's the ADA on this? Where's the ADA? Why are you pulling ADA? All right, so the way, the way it works is like this. He's talking about ADA. So every fire escape I'm ever going to look at, I certify as of the date of its installation. And if it was built in 1931, and the rails are 36 inch high, and the bars are 8 inches apart, I will certify that fire escape, and you can't force me to upgrade it. It's not going to go to 42. It's not going to be 4 inches on center. So I certify as of the date of its installation which is standard in your fire code. You already know this. You can't make somebody put a 19, you know, 2019 sprinkler system because you like it. It's got bells and whistles and lights. And the guy's got this thing from 1917. What does the fire sprinkler company do? They maintain it as of the date of its installation. And the pipes are the pipes and the heads are the heads and whatever. So you can replace. But until you've met either 50% renovation of the building and you've exceeded the level 1, level 2, or level 3, because that triggers code, sprinklers, all kinds of upgrade. But sometimes you guys are going to have a historical building, also known as a hysterical building, where they have two means of egress inside plus an elevator, but because they want to keep the fire escape on the outside because it's visually appealing as of the day of the, when, it was, when it was put in the building. So it's a historical look piece. Now you have to certify that fire escape, even though they have two other means of egress. You don't just patch it so that it'll hang on, because your farming can use it by mistake, and so can the tenants inside use it by mistake. So, so far, have I told you anything you didn't know? Or did you kind of know this, but in a different way, or to a different, a different fire protection piece? Everything I've told you, you already know, you just never applied it to the bastard child of egress. Because as soon as sprinklers came in in the 1920s, guess where fire escapes went? Outside. Guess what was inside? Sprinklers. So for a hundred years, guess what you guys can concentrate on? Saving people or saving the building? Saving the building. 
So with sprinklers came smoke detectors. What else? Exit lights. Egress planning. Yeah, everything. And the fire escapes are outside knocking on the door. When I did it, guys, like, yeah, yeah, come and feed that homeless fire escape. Is it a nickel? Hey, welding guy, witch doctor, paint guy, go. Go kill a chicken for this guy and dance around. This, see, there's comedy in fire escapes. <laughs> <laughs> Until somebody dies, then it gets serious real quick. Yes? So you guys, are you guys doing 20 more things? <coughs> yes. Have you started that at all? Starts, uh, I, I purposely picked start Four. date days to start dates. That's why I, I think I had called and said, by the way, because you know they kept, right. we actually looked at that building two years ago. That's a lot. And then they went through several management right. people, and, and you guys got to, you guys got a big problem there because there's an egress concern on the right. inside, and I think Alan is going to speak about that in a little bit um, uh, after we go through a couple more slides. Alan's going to talk to you about because he took pictures while he did the inside. Remember, Alan, you took yeah. pictures from the elevator as soon as you get in, like you look left and you look right, and it kind of ends up into a, a place that somebody closed off the hallway to the fire escape. That is on almost every floor. That needs to be resolved, and that same thing happened in uh, Houston on a. On a on a 12, a 12 story building that Gabe did. Same exact scenario. Very common thing because who let that happen? Building department. And for uh, shits and giggles, one of the buildings I scheduled a walk through for was 40 North First Street, right next door to 28 North First Street. Yep. You'll love that one too. Perfect. <laughs> Let's have some fun. All right, let's. Uh, but right now, firefighters are taking down the ladders and rolling up the hoses. But earlier in the night, when they pulled up, there were flames coming out of the side of the building. Firefighters say it was one of the scarier moments because when you pull through the building charge. and you see children and mothers hanging out the side of the fire escape, smoke swirling around them, they said that's scary, scary stuff. They got up there, they got the ladders up, and they said nobody got hurt. The uh, fire escape, there was uh, three or four people hanging off the fire escape. They couldn't get off. They were just on the fire escapes. I had people hanging in the fire escapes at the rear of the building, and on this side of the building, they, we had a bunch of people on that fire escape. Uh, about 50 people were displaced inside this building. I'm our fire fire There's good news tonight. It looks like everybody will be allowed to go back in, except the one unit where the fire was in. They said, that's good luck to them tonight. I'm Bob Wilson, on the scene of Bridgeport, News 8. Now, a lot of times, uh because you're videotaping, that really draws them yeah. out yeah, pretty quick. All right, how about that? They called me six months later to come look at that fire escape. All of them. Every single one failed. I called the fire marshal in the city of Bridgeport and said, hey, every fire escape had life safety conditions, not just the one that... And as you can see, children... When was the last time you taught a five-year-old or an eight-year-old how to maneuver a fire escape ladder and go down by themselves? 12 feet to 15 feet off the ground. Right? And then six months later, I went to look at it. Guess what they've done till the present day, to my knowledge? Strictly paint. Strictly paint. Got it? All right. So I'm going to talk briefly. I'm going to introduce Alan. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the, some of the, uh, some of the uh, questionnaires that we have out there. So open up your books. Let me tell you what you guys have. So let's take a look at the book first. Okay, page one. Talks about how to get started in a fire escape awareness program. How many years is it going to take for us to get this going, guys? Three to five. Three to five years. Okay. So don't rush because they will be shooting at you. Money is going to shoot at you now. You're not supposed to know this stuff. What's about, what about this lead safe issue? EPA. $37,500 fine. So you got to scrape a fire escape that's older than 78. How many older fire, older than 1978 fire escape do you guys have? You got a bunch? They all have lead. Can I weld on it? No. Okay. So, and they're all made with bolts and rivets. What do I replace it with? Weld. 
called bolt and rivet. Can I ever leave the rusty? The, can I ever leave a rusty connection that I just change the bolt and leave the rust? Can I ever do that? No. No. Can I ever load test without ever going through any repairs anything that has internal rust? No. And the reason is because what's it look like inside? What kills tenants and firemen? The inside has eaten the shaft, which used to be three quarter, uh, three eighths thick. Right? This is the original shaft. As soon as it starts looking like this, and you step on it the wrong way, live load, concentrated load, running load, what happens? Will that shear? You get the shaft. Right? We got everything, guys, here. So, this is a clamp. How do you know that something has just sheared? That's brown, right? You see any silver there? No? And uh, this is my, my box of <laughs> magic over here. Is that a brand new shear? Silver? When you see silver, is that brand new? Yes. So when I get there and somebody claims, oh my god, that just broke! And there's no silver, what's it mean? Mine just broke. It did just break. When did it break? How many years? It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Okay? All right, guys. You need an exam, a report. The initial report, the pre-load test evaluation, is a simple report that takes some of the components. And how many components? Let's see if I've covered every piece of a component on my checkbox here. Ready? Overall structure, is that the entire system? Overall paint, does that take care of the paint requirement, which is a maintenance requirement in the code? Must be structure style, must be, must be kept painted. <coughs> Structural support. Grading on the plate, on the platforms, does it cover that? All the rails on the platforms are going down the stairs. The stringers, if you have staircases, the stringers. The treads on the stringers. The ladder to the roof and the ladder to the ground. A cantilever to the ground. A possible catwalk over a roof to get to the fire escape, which is a hundred feet further away. And all the cement footings on the ground, if it's, she's got lace to the ground. Did I miss any part of a fire escape? So your preload test evaluation, is it a very thick report or is it a snapshot? Snapshot. Snapshot saying that if I show you photos of any internal rust, can we proceed to load test? Prepare first, then schedule the load test. Under whose direction? Who originally inspected it? Who's going to design the load test? Maybe we should ask the building department for some guidance. What do you guys think? No. No. Because <laughs> now you have to pull a load test permit in the city of Portland. They giving any of that money to the fireman fund? So why does Portland still want to hold on to the fire escape load test and make you pull permits? In? Okay, twelve points, guys. Right? We're talking about the overall structure. If you got this report in your hand by anybody, this is a very fancy report. I spent thousands of dollars building this. But if you had a guy, when everybody's got a digital camera, right? And they sent you their, their uh, some information with 12 points covered, right, on their letterhead. And they sent you 12 individual pictures. Well, that, is that okay to report for you guys? Yeah. As an initial pre-load test evaluation. And he has identified that it has internal rust or it doesn't have internal rust. Do we care about the paint job at this time? Who can paint? Anybody can paint as long as they have, there's no lead on the fire escape, as long as... It's a TPA renovator, so any, we can bring the paint guys back at the end. They're not the first to arrive anymore. They're the last arriving at the party. And we're going to talk about the structural support, so we're going to talk about the overall structure, the overall paint, the overall supports, the grading platforms of cement on every, every motel, every uh, Romeo and Juliet balcony out in the wind. We're going to take care of all the rails, we're going to take care of all the stringers, if they have, otherwise you say N.A. doesn't apply. Treads, 
ladders through the roof, ladders to the ground, if they apply. What's the ladder through the roof for? Who's that for? It's not for the tenants. It's not for the vendors. It's for you guys. You know, today's OSHA code says on any, on any uh, ladders that now have loops around them, or if you're building new ones today, OSHA says no more loops. I know we put a shitload of loops on everybody, but from now on, no more loops. We want you to harness on when you climb this ladder, because you got some of the biggest problems getting people out who passed out inside these loops. So it's, how many years does it usually take to figure things out? 25 minutes? How long has it taken the building department to figure this out? A hundred years. And what did they do when they finally opened the bag uh, pool and they looked inside and said, this is for you. And then they went and then they did what to it? <laughs> See, there's comedy in fire escape. You guys didn't, just didn't realize it. Alright, let's keep going. Cement footings and little diagrams. Are these little diagrams helpful? You know who else does that? Nobody. But that's okay. If somebody doesn't give you the little diagrams, you're still going to take a design professional's documentation that includes a write-up and 12 to 24 photographs, identifying only what right now? Internal verification that this there is some of this, or there is none of this. If there is none of this, but it's the original square head bolts, right? What do you want to do? Proceed to the. Hold me for a no, no, no. I've, I'm an engineer for 40 years. My, my signature is good. You say, oh, that's good. You want to write it with this pen? You give him this pen. Say, hey, write it with this pen. It almost killed one of our last firemen. Otherwise, what do you pull out? Because they're keeping behind what? Square head bolts? You have a question? Let me just tell the story of the, of the bolts. Why should you change the bolts every 25 to 35 years? No, common sense. Let's use common sense. I got a building in your downtown. Have you seen, through the building department, all the windows changed on that on average every 25 to 35 years? Have you seen the electrical upgraded or replaced every 25 to 35 years? Have you seen the plumbing uh, upgraded every 25 to 35 years on average? Sometimes 50, but on average, right? The roof, has it been upgraded or replaced or, re, or redone in the, every 25 to 35 years on average? The boiler in the basement, has it been replaced on average every 25 to 35 years? How about the fire escape? 100 years of square bolts in the So, uh, oh, there's also a catch-all. It's called other non-conforming other issues, which is they got a chicken coop under the fire escape. They built this beautiful um, barbecue with eight tanks underneath it. They put electrical underneath the main power boxes. They found this great little place underneath the fire escape to have the main junction box for the entirety of the building underneath the fire escape. They're parking cars underneath the fire escape. Nobody uses that. Might as well block the fire lanes. You guys don't or really do anything anyway. Where so they, they go to nowhere. <laughs> well, they go to nowhere. So guys, confidence test. 25 point questionnaire, right? This is not your questionnaire. I'm going to show you your questionnaire. But every one of your questions came from this question. So the Bricer, the Bricer submittal that we're going to do on your behalf is not this, but it's every one of these questions. I have to ask you every one of these questions so you understand why we ask this question. Because it answers the functionality of a fire escape or it will answer the other two critical questions during a five year and that is the structural questions and the, is there a code violation. Because talking about grandfathering in, can I grandfather in something that was done wrong in 1931 today? If it was done wrong on the date of its installation, so somebody put in 24 inch rails back in 31, and they say, no, I can keep those. 
say, no, you can't. You got to bring it up to 36 <coughs> minimally. But while you're there, dude, just bring it up to 42. But can you? So I'll repeat that question. Pre-existing non-conforming structures can be maintained indefinitely as of the date of its installation. Pre, so that's pre-existing non-conforming, right? So, no, non-conforming means sometimes you got hallways that should be 42, they're actually 36. It's pre-existing, not conforming on an existing structure. You can maintain that indefinitely. You can't force the... the non-conforming today, but it's a pre-existing condition. Yeah, it's a pre-existing condition. But the pre-existing condition was itself illegal in 1931. Can you keep it today when I finally identify it? So our job is to find things. So if all of a sudden in a sprinkler system, I'll give you an example. A 1917 sprinkler system, you know, was done and then somewhere in the line finally identified when a wall came down, they went from the pipe to copper and then it went back to pipe. Allowed to keep the copper? No, because copper was never allowed to be introduced. You know what I'm saying? Well, no, well, Nobody ever told us about that. I know because it's never been exposed. But it works. I know it works, but you can't because there's a possibility it won't work. And it usually you'll we'll have a, a dead fireman to prove that you know that one time it didn't work. This usually kills a fireman, not anybody else. So I'm going to go over these 25 questions. This is the this is what Philadelphia did. They took a building inspection form what's called an envelope study, and you guys should start looking at your structures over six stories, okay? Because they have this all over the country, they inspect it. It's called an envelope inspection, facade inspection. They just took out the word facade and they put in fire escapes. This is their form. There's no questionnaire, there's no guidance. So I think Philadelphia's doing it. Okay? These are the typical components of a fire escape. So they built them in 1920, never built any more again. So has anything changed in the fire escape industry? So if you see a new one built today, do they build it you know, with new technology or do they just copy one from across the street that they see? Got it? Guidelines on how to, con how to repair connections. Tags, guys. The only... There's only two cities that, that force you to put tags on your fire escape, Seattle and Portland. They want a red, a white, or a yellow. So you guys want to make sure that your, your policy includes the tagging of the fire escape. So as soon as the fire escape gets tagged, not only does it have the information of who inspected it, it tells you what day it's over. So when you're doing your building inspections, what happens when you walk by a fire escape and it's 2021 and it says that Next inspection is 2020. Pretty simple. So, so with that, this is what we're going to be covering, and we have been covering until the present day. And this is what, if you want, you want to post anything next to you when you're dealing with fire escapes in your area, wherever you sit, just post this in a picture. Just put that on the wall. So when everybody's giving you a hard time, pull this whole book down and re-educate yourself again. This is getting recorded, so we'll, this is free online. But remind, who does Farscape save? Children, tenants, firemen. Who's never, never gonna be in this picture? Owner. Building inspector, owner. owner, management company, mayor. mayor. Got it? How long is it gonna take to fix this? How do you do it? Head up or head down? Some codes. Awareness. You know what the biggest thing about liability is? What did you know and when did you know it? So if they didn't want this to happen, they should have never let me come here. Now you all know. And I can be on either side of the fence. <laughs> Somebody got horrifically killed in the San Jose fire. Three years from now, they're like, what? Really? Let's see if they have a program. Oh, oh, you forgot, you didn't even implement that program? Oh. We're all on negligence. Did you send a letter out 
So, who, so who are you going to send the letter out through first? The clerk's office, right? It's the fire department uh, bulletin sent out through the clerk's office, uh, tied in with your tax request. Every, you guys send that out every three months. You got to send it out four times so that nobody says I didn't know. And, and on it has a disclaimer. If your building has an external egress, please call us for further clarification. But this is the code as of 2016. Uh, if, if not, you may own a building. Otherwise, if your building doesn't have this and you only have one building and it has no fire safety, disregard this notice. You just pushed everybody in the city of San Jose to the other side of the liability table. We informed them. Well, how, how can you have done anything about this building? Oh, dude, we got we have 25,000 builders we're dealing with. Yeah. You say you have a template of that letter? Yeah, I do. Send that out just through building. Take a good project for a pro you Right. <laughs> Rusty. Rusty's going to be busy. All right, guys. Let's, uh, so, so with that, now let's take a look at the second one. And I'm going to have Alan come up. So, so there's 25 questions there, right? And he's going to do, we're going to go question by question, right? And, uh, and what he did is uh, I asked him to take Reg 4 in L.A. And this is the Reg 4. This is the exact Reg 4 in L.A. So, Alan, just give me a, a second here. Let me, you're, you're going to be talking about, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be talking about, we're going to compare how we modify the Reg 4, and they haven't accepted it in L.A. yet, and this is the only testing in all of Los Angeles is this form for fire escape. And we're going to show you how your form, we've modified the one year so that it's a, what's a, it's a testing form, right. testing. testing it based on the fact that a five year was performed. So on the testing, we don't ask code questions and we don't ask structural questions, but we can identify structural concerns that require and need another five year again because a truck hit it, something something damaged the building, right? So uh, you and I can talk about this, so I'll come on up. So please, it's all online. Is this the one that I created? No, this is theirs. This is the original, so the annual firescape assemblies. Can I just say, can I say that? Sure. Cisco is like, like, we're like Penn and Teller, you know, Cisco can talk your ear off and off. I'm like the quiet guy. I'm so um, quiet. Okay. <laughs> no. I, uh, I just recently completed the, you know, got the Reg 4 testing. I just recently got my Reg 4 certification from LA. And what we're finding is that, even based on our case today, that the uh, Red Force inspections maybe don't, they don't go enough into what we're doing with five-year inspections. So there's a lot of gray areas in there that they're kind of taking on responsibility maybe for things that they shouldn't be. But, so the Red Force testing is every year. And it's basically, even, even in the terminology of Red Force, they're saying, you guys are not calling yourself inspectors, you're calling yourself testers. And when you test on a fire escape. The only thing to test is the ladder system. But we're also inspecting, you know, components, and, but we're not doing it in the sense of saying, hey, this is certain. So starting with that, and that's why we have, LA has the one year. Right now, they don't really even have a five-year inspection program in place. So you'll see differences between, so what I've done is I've taken this direct for, and what I've done here is kind of modified some of these questions you guys. So starting off, you're going to go through... Hold on, let's, let's just on one piece. So this is what they work with now in all of LA. And Bricer would make you use this because they, they have a template. But notice how, how what we've done to it. He basically took my 25 questions and said, take the 25 questions and pull out just testing questions of how a guy with no license and not an engineer, not an architect, could just test the fire escape. So notice... Let's just go over a few, a few quick questions and, and we'll show you the crossover. And again, I just want to say that this sheet that I have here is, is a little bit different than what the Reg 4 is. Right, right. This, is, this is actually Bricer and Reg 4. So all components, stairs and uh, uh, landings and railing ladders and braces are in good repair. Is that a, a, is that a use question or is that a structural question? Okay. So. Uh, bolts and rivets and welds appear to be in good condition. 
Is that a use question or is that a structural question? There are no attachments on any parts of the fire escape assembly. There's, there are no attachments, meaning, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, what do you call it? The cable, cable dishes and such. Landings are firmly attached to the structure. Is that a use question? Or is that a structural question? Structural. Structural. So now what? So our, my exam, I basically now morphed it into a Bricer one. So now go, so let's forget about this so now. So the first Because question, it's online, but he's going to now look at the question. So let's add one, so one at a time. So LA, and I'm sure when we go through the protocol and everything for, for San Jose, you're going to have your own format. But, you know, first they have notification. So in LA, you're notifying the local fire uh, department or you're, you know, depending on the size of the building, might go more centrally to downtown LA. But then the first thing that we're, that we're looking for is that a five-year inspection has been completed and a certification is on file. If I, as a Reg 4, let's say Reg 4, and let's say I'm, you know, Reg 4, you don't have to be a, a structural uh, place of compression on my guy. But, so a guy that doesn't really know, he can go and say, where's your five-year? And if it's, if it's in order, it's, let's say it's two years after the five-year is completed, he can feel comfortable that a structural engineer has looked at this. Otherwise, can he proceed? If he gets in, there's no five years. Can a one-year guy proceed with an inspection? No. So I recommend the reason why they they, they say it should you should be a, you should be told that there's an up and coming. You don't have to you don't have to witness it, but you have to be notified. Five year engineer has to be notified of a pending uh, sprinkler test that you may or may not wish to uh, to uh, inspect. Uh, you know, uh, attend. There's also a fire safety inspection. So. You, that way you'll, you'll already be aware. Captain Rusty will be there saying, hey, I got, I got this. Where, before you go do your sprinkler test, where's your fire escape certification? And with that, and I'll let you continue answering the questions, can we, do a, can, can we have Alan there doing a, a preload test evaluation and identify safe areas on the fire escape that a, even though it's not certifiable, that a sprinkler company can do their inspections with him there saying that's a safe area, you can you can inspect the the, the, the sprinkler. Can we can we have it under under that kind of control? And if something happens, who who, who pays the price? Is are we dealing with a certified fire escape or are we dealing with a, a we need to low test this system, you know, the, the sprinkler. Can he be there? On the whose liability? Ours or theirs? The building owners and the sprinkler company guys, right? Otherwise there's gonna be a little coordination because sometimes they can't fix the fire escape fast enough. But you still need those sprinkler tests. So you may have to have a preload test evaluation done to identify the areas where the test is going to happen. Now you want some eyes on that place that day? You want to have some eyes there to make sure that, you know, because this is a representation of what your firemen are going to do. So preload test evaluation. Go ahead. So again, you know, with five year, especially if you're just starting a program, you may not, you know, any of these buildings are going to have a five year. That's going to be pretty much the so then after the five year, we have the certification, okay, you know, we know that this fire escape is good for a no, number of years, but we want to, what can happen in the last two years? Well, it could have been hit by a truck. The ladder was hit by a truck, but it wasn't picked up in the five, five years, two years ago. Or just anything, any accident that could happen. So those are the type of things we're looking for. So, you know, then we're looking for uh, fire escape peers to have access to the roof for personal Fire personnel per code. Easy enough. Yes, yeah, it does. Fire escape appears, uh, has access to grade and a clear path to the public way for code. Uh, that's pretty easy for anybody you know, to take a look. I just, I was just saying, I just inspected one in San Francisco yesterday. Start at the top, went down to the first platform. First platform sitting on a roof that was obviously built. Fire escape went in. There was nowhere, nowhere for the fire escape to go. I climbed over the balcony, walked over, the, walked about 20 feet to the edge of the roof. There's nothing protecting you there. It's a ladder. It's like, so, um, platforms appear ready for your intended use with no apparent visual damage. So these are all things you can look at. You don't have to be, you know, again, it's just a way to, to, notice, to notice that hey, this has changed since five years. 
we noticed maybe this was this was hit or something something to this. So we're going to bring it to your attention, bring it to the fire department's attention that this is going to be further examination either by you or a third party. Um, fixed air components, <coughs> connections, and clips appear ready for their intended use with no apparent damage, suspect areas, or internal rust. Uh, again, five years, maybe that's not, but we're just constantly monitoring, monitoring the fire escapes. Uh, all rails and connections appear to be in good order, ready for their intended use, with no apparent damage, so, <coughs> suspect areas or internal rust, and are ready for a 200-pound uh, lateral load. So the lateral uh, railing is, is 200 pounds as opposed to 100. Uh, windows and door egress openings appear to be in working, proper working order. So we're, we're looking for signage, looking for the doors are operating properly, and so on. Um, fixed air components, connections, and clips appear ready for the intended use with no apparent damage. Suspect areas are eternal rust. Walls are structurally sound. We talked about that. Uh, and the fire escape has no structures. Egress. Um, it is clear to the public way for her, as we mentioned before. So these are the inspection. Then we're getting into the actual um, you know, the testing of the fire escape stairs or ladders or whatever it might be. So first we're looking at, is the ladder to grade? Is it fixed, balanced, weighted, hydraulic, scissor, fold out, or other? And we need to throw in a cantilever. Because that's one thing I noticed. We need to probably tag yeah, exactly. as ladders or can cantilevers. Right, right. You know, uh, again, because that'll, that'll apply. So there's, there's not as many cantilevers as you may imagine. A lot of ladders. So 75% of the ladders, the 25% are actual staircases with a big weight box on it. So we need to add that on there. Try, try that. So um, then we're going to release it. We're going to release the fire escape uh, the mechanism twice and make sure it's operating easily and appears to have been properly served. So every, like in San Francisco, they need to be serviced every year to keep great grease and maintain, make sure the cable is, is, is we get into it. Not voluntary, by code. Very care. When it's voluntary, it's, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if it's, if it's mandatory, it's codified, now this is, you must prove that with a, this with a sticker. Go ahead. Uh, ladder traveled the ground properly with minimal assistance or hesitation. Ladder remains stable in a position after reaching the ground. So many of the accordion ladders will be will drop it, and drop it, it'll be like you know, two or three feet to grade. To grade. It's not acceptable. Um, ladder was able to return to its position, to its position to crank it back up, which, believe it or not, probably hardly ever happens these days. But, um, It'll go down, but she won't come back up. Yeah. So that's why you drop it twice. Which is always kind of a pain for the inspector. <laughs> but um, then you're going to inspect the cables. So inspect uh, cable appears to be in good order, ready for their intended use. Cables are not frayed or, or corroded, have no apparent staining or, or damage. Many times we get the air all black, covered with all kinds of oil or dust or anything that, that you can find on. Uh, the pulley, ass pulley assemblies um, or assemblies appear to be in good condition, move freely with no internal rust. And then a lot of times we find cast iron pulleys, which are not so very brittle, so we make sure that that's not the case. We don't find them very often. But um, the count you can inspect the counterweights to appear to be in good condition with no apparent distress or internal rust. Um, many times they're all sandwiched together. And we'll find uh, rust jacking in between. You can actually see them separate. And then uh, we need a protective chain or barrier at the stair. Uh, single action, usually it's just a simple. Yeah, it's 24 to 36 inches of the most opening. So those are to the fire escape. So this is one we're kind of working on the verbiage of this, and it's it's taking a little bit of what cleaned up a little bit of what LA had done and kind of filled in. Building some holes that we think they had. That's pretty much it. So let me uh, let's let's uh, I'm going to play now a piece. So did any of the questions he asked answer any code or st structural questions, or is this th them verifying that there was a five year? 
done by others. Right? So, in L.A., they sued the last two guys who played on that lawsuit. They sued the last two one-year inspectors because some of these questions pull them in. But are they design professionals or others acceptable to the building official? Structural and code. They do sprinklers, they do alarms, they do all kinds of things. So are they really structural engineers or architects? So they sued the last two they got brought into the lawsuit. Now I believe they're going to be released from it because we proved that you can't ask these kind of questions of the janitor. You know, the doctor in the, in the hospital is different from the janitor in the hospital, and they both are in the operating room. Are there questions that you mentioned? The L.A. City questions didn't mention anything about college. Correct, right, and that's a, and that's a my 25-point question there. But do you feel comfortable, right, that if you had a company that came from San Francisco that did or did not have licenses or was or was not trained, but or, or a fire protection company that went through and, and, and just basically tested the system because it says, do you have a five-year? So who answers the code and the structural questions? These guys are the five-year guys. So you ask, the first question you have is, do you have a five-year certificate? The answer is yes. How hard is it to do this? Can any one of you answer these questions for the owner? Well, they're not asking you to do it, but they're asking for them to bring somebody aboard. So if a, if a fire protection company went and got some training and, and they did this, so if a guy out of L.A. came up with his right for license and did just this, would you accept his four-year, I mean his one-year testing of the system from the roof all the way down, looking at all the doors and windows, Nothing looks broken, came to the ladder, released it twice, brought it back up, it's functioning. Was there a code, was there a structural or code review done at this time? So is this a good document for San Jose to have? Your fire escapes from now on looked every year? By the way, could I have sprinkler guys do these one years before they perform their one years? Right? They went to the roof, because the, the, you know, the Pipes go all the way to the roof. Can you witness it? Yeah, it says, you know, tell us what you're going to do because we want, we may or may not want to witness. And after you've done a few companies, you're like, you know, you guys are doing it? I'm all set. I know you guys are going to do it right. And they signed this. But the first question is, there are five. And if there is, who owns the, who owns the structural and code requirements on that fire escape? This guy or the five-year guy? The five-year guy. And so this is a testing document. This is not a testing document. This has code questions, this has structural questions, and then it has operational questions. See the, see the onion? You guys cool with the one year? We've got the five year coming, so I'm going to get this right till 12 o'clock. And as a matter of fact, if I can end just a hair early, we're going to go out and test your fire escape. So I need to get quickly onto the next part of the inspection, right? There's another battery in case that one's. So I want to end this class at our lunch, whether it's 12 o'clock or 12.30, and we'll go to 1.30 before we go. Because normally my class is six hours long. There's a team that can be there in the morning. And then they have to leave by 12 or 12.30, 12 1 o'clock. You know what I'm saying? They can't come back. So if you want three hours uh, for continuing ed credits or six hours, after we do the towers and you take a one-hour lunch, or we'll grab a lunch, we're going to go somewhere in downtown? Yeah. So we're going to go there and do some inspections downtown. So, and that, so what we're going to learn on your fire tower, you're going to do the same thing now down in downtown, and it's going to be recorded. Okay? Where have I done this? I've done this in, in Seattle. I've done this in Portland. I've done this in many states. Has it always worked out? Because how long does it take to make it work? How long have they screwed it up? Who don't you want back in the mix? Because they want to make money off of what? Permits and load testing, right? Say, guys, we got this. Design professionals. Now, just so you know, the permit does apply. So let me get on to the next slide. A permit does apply. So if I'm maintaining my fire escape and painting, do I need a permit? No. If I change a bolt on a fire escape, one bolt or all bolts, do I need a permit? Nope, it's, maintain, it's maintenance. If I sister a piece of steel on a fire escape, do I need a permit? Nope, because it, I'm matching with, exe, match, matching with like materials. 
I'm extending the balcony to pick up an additional window and penetrating the wall. Permit. I need a permit for what part? Penetrating the wall. The extension. So are we still going to be without permits on this? Yes. Do you see who's going to watch it? This guy. Why? Because who signs off on the end? This guy does. So he's there at the beginning. He's there at the end. With load tests or other evidence of strength, so who's really going to pay the bill? Not done wrong. If not done right. But you guys have a system. There's a one-year system. There's a five-year system. And who's your dep deputies on this one? Sprinkler guys. Why? Because they can't go on the platform. They can't go on. Says who? OSHA. Says OSHA. <laughs> when you put all the codes in front of you, and then the welding guy says, dude, I've been fixing fire escapes for, all my, for 30 years. You say, yeah. Let me, let me call uh, EPA and do what for you? <laughs> Give you a fine, a $37,500 fine. Because you're done. What about the paint guy? Same thing. Must scrape and paint it and follow all the EPA guidelines. Okay, so let's move quickly. So this is the, this is, I've worked with many cities. I've, this is one of my pilot cities, model city, Lowell. Same 25 question, questionnaires, the same 25 questions. They just, you know, position is different. This is an exact model of Seattle. You go to seattle.gov, you will find this exact thing, and you can just copy and just put your logo up there, and you're good to go. Today, you're getting the latest, greatest version of everything. Got it? See the checklist, the annual? The annual has gotten a lot better, guys, because you know the only thing you need to do on an annual? Bolts and supports are not damaged or rusted, pass or fail. Paint is in good condition. All moving parts, ladders, catwalks, stairs, windows, and doors all seem operable. And you know who can sign on this on the one year? Anybody you deem. So do we feel comfortable with sprinkler companies now identifying and doing the one years before they, if there's already an existing five? They're going to like uh, some additional business? Don't they check the, 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 the U brackets also to the fire escape anyway as part of their whole system? So do you think they're going to they're gonna love this inspection routine going on? One year. Oh, fire escape engineers inspect the summary video. Here this we is are. an LA and inspection that's LA. certified this is by a one year certificate from Red Four. Watch. Just listen. A one year exam. Yeah. But now, as we look closer and it's going through its five year, you can see a few things that we're going to discuss. This is a hotel. Um, but they already have a certified so one year on this. First of all, they want to open it. They want to knock the paint permit. As you can see, this fire escape has not been kept painted. It is a full paint job, even though it passed in a one year. Okay? So, fire escapes must be structurally sound, must be kept painted. Why the paint? The paint is what seals these joints, seals these connections from water getting into them and rotting out the structural. Pay attention because we're going to go to your fire escape right after. So, this. somebody passes it without paint on it over us, you know. So, that's the first thing that's a lot of times is not done on a five year. I'm mean, not done on a one year, but it's done on a, on a five year. Now, let's take a look at the rest of the fire escape in itself. Regarding the paint, it still has lead paint. Anything older than 1978 is presumed to have led by the EPA. So whoever's going to scrape and paint this must have an EPA renovator's license. They're not going to de-lead this fire escape. They're just going to collect all the proper chips under EPA rules and guidelines, which has a $37,500 fine. And make sure that those are properly disposed of. And then they can paint. And then you want to seal all the cracks and crevices, all the joints. You want to seal it from water intrusion. So this, again, this fire escape passed a one year. Let's take a look at why it wouldn't pass, it didn't pass a five year. And if it can't pass a five year, it can't pass a one year. Um, and we'll show you why. So, look at all the damage in there, okay? So that's not properly connected to the building. And that's something that they covered up with the, the cement stucco. And as you can see, that's fully exposed. And that should have been identified by a Reg 4 inspector to say, hey, I can't give you a one year because I see some other things on this fire escape that need a five year inspection in order for me to continue with my one years. All right, 
So let's go down slowly. I can already see the cables up here. These look like original cables, and I'll be able to see them down below. And the cables look to be in good order, but they are old enough that I would think that replacement would be considered at this time. So that's a major issue with rust right there. Look at all this rust right here, along, underneath all of these pieces. What they look like when you grill them, they look like this. So that's one that's already popped. That's one that's already popped. That's one that's clearly popped. And yet it, it passed the one year. How did it pass the one year? Okay, checked all the connections. All original hardware. The hardware is supposed to be changed every 25 to 35 years in the lifetime of a fire escape. So you should also see these square head bolts all removed and new hex head bolts. But these are original the day it went up. So if this building is 50, 75, 100 years old, these are the original connections. And the reason you keep it painted so that water doesn't get in there, look at all that water getting in there. And it does this, it pops. So look, I figured go through, see the, the shaft there still? Look at that. So it's a false. And if I look underneath here, you'll see. So this is very common. All right, let's take a look at the tubes, the clips. Rust jacking is happening underneath here. So these are some of the things that a five-year inspection would identify. Look at all this. It's accumulating rivets. But look at all the accumulation. That is water that's going to get in there, and it's going to keep attacking these rivets all day long. Okay, let's look underneath. So that area is uninspectable. There's a through bolt. There's a through bolt. And we clearly know that we have some issues because they didn't paint this, that some materials, even though they look good, even though the bolts are going on, all of the violation, right? You can clearly see that, that some of these are already popped, so now all of them are suspect. We have to verify one at a time. They've also sealed the lower uh, connection into the building, and that's a through bolt there, too. That one you can't even see anymore. They stuck it right over it. And as you can see how deep this is. So that's all stuck. It's a nice looking building, but that's the thing you have to look at. Okay, coming down. Accumulation. All this accumulation is just going to trap water and send. Look at all the rust jacking. It's happening in that clip. Not as much so, but anybody doing a rake for inspection one year would have identified some structural issues that would be called for a one year. I mean, the one year become a five year. Accumulation. Rust jacking. Rush jacking. Okay, coming here. And this one, you can already see the rivet already popped. The rivet already popped. Okay, so when you see the rivet already popped, they can't do a one year. Alright? So looking underneath, all these treads look good. But knowing that there's accumulation from above, it's only a matter of time before they eat the rivet. It's just a hammered rivet. That's an indication that this is 50 to 75 years old. So a lot of times, fire escapes that are this old, they're supposed, supposed to have a change. Well, the connections. See, this is a, supposed to be a bolted connection. So in order for me to gate this, unless I actually a load test this, I can't sign, sign off a of five year, but as soon as I put a, a piece of metal above this, bolt it there, bolt it there, I, I don't care about this well anymore. All right, the handle. The handle that releases this. It's kind of in a weird location. I have to go, and again, this is a one year pass. So as you can see, it's a one-year annual. Okay, so they would have had they seen. Look at all the rust checking in that corner right there. Okay, that person who inspected this would have said, I can't pass this on a one-year. Look at all the rust checking inside here. Rust checking in that connection holding the whole entire stairs. Inability to verify certain connections. Okay, there's a plate here. Okay, and this is the release. The release is in the wrong side, and it looks like it's ready to pop. Okay, so definitely need the paint job. Water accumulation is getting behind this, and then I'm going to pop right there. So if this is what occurs when you inspect the fire escape on uh, one year. You're really looking for a couple things on a one year. Does this ladder, when I release it, go down? Slowly, two to three feet per second, hit the ground and stay down. Can I do that twice? Is the mechanism in a good space? 
Does it have a chain? Does the windows work getting to the fire escape? So I, I went for the systems and you verify that the system looks good all the way up to the roof. And you walk, it looks like it's been kept painted, and that any moving parts do drop and that you can get from the roof to grade. As soon as anybody sees something that is an indication that there's a structural concern, it turns into an automatic five year. Okay, so knowing that you see the rust pop, you know, pieces of steel pop. Farscape is, has all original hardware, has not been kept painted, usually is an indication, but they still get paid for their one year inspection. But it's a five year inspection now. Okay. Um, I'm going to have another one just like this on the back side. This weight box has to be greased so that it slides properly. And at the same time, we need to verify that the cables are in good order. They seem to be in good order. But a lot of times, if this is the original cable, they want to swap these out. They're inexpensive. And you want to grease the cables up there also and the pulleys. Okay, on the one year, that's the routine maintenance is to grease it, let it make sure it drops through to three feet per second. And that this mechanism here is in a, in a way that people can use it. And a lot of times, this mechanism will be most likely somewhere here so that when you turn it, it turns away from you and you can access. And then you can get the changes drops. Okay? And a very important piece of uh, information during any construction, all fire escapes must be certified first under NFPA rule 1910.37 that you must have two means of egress during construction, buildings under construction. So, any questions, fire escape engineers, 866 Wow. So, if you guys get called in to help uh, LA, you know, fight some fires on their buildings. How comfortable are you getting on every fire escape down there now? <laughs> so now you understand why? Because the, the building, because the building department had a stranglehold on this for a hundred years. You know why? The fire department finally says we can't do anything about this guy. So our only thing, our, our only training that we can give you is don't get on. Wait for aerials to arrive. Wait for other things. To do. Don't get on. And what? Well, how do we get in the building? Well, put on your oxygen tank and go through the first floor instead of going through the back because the fire's on the front of the building and they use a good fire escape on the back that you can use to go fight this fire but they say no no go into the flames or go into the mouth of the dragon and then as we said before I'll take your question in a second as we said before even though they tell you not to use the fire escape part of your main training as a rookie is what? on a fire escape all right, so we're going to go out there now, uh, uh, look at the time. We're going to bring the camera out. Let's bring up the other camera, uh, Alan. But listen to this, guys, right? This is the peeling back of the onion. Do you agree that any one of you or anybody that is going to be near a fire escape can, for, can perform a one year after a five year has been done? So this is, this is you can get a little loosey-goosey on this one, but this is really like, this is the eyeball opinion test, right? And, and if you miss something here, the lawsuit, there's not much lawsuit here because what you're really relying upon? The five year. The five year in your documentation is 25 questions, which we're not gonna go into right now, right? But you look at the 25 questions, what is the question? Is there internal rust on the platform? This is a platform cutout. Is there internal rust in this? Guys? Yes. Yes. Is there internal rust in the treads, guys? Yes. Is there, inter is there a material loss anywhere on the fire escape that needs to be sistered or replaced? Yes. yes. Is there any indication that the water has come through and is eating the bolt, the through bolt, because you've got all these rusty tears coming? Yes. Is there any indication that somebody's stuck on the building and I can no longer examine these? And most likely the only way to tr truly test this is through a low test or can I let this sleeping dog lie and next to it, four to six inches away, put in a Hilti bolt that has a data sheet, go in eight to 12 inches deep with an epoxy bolt, make a connection back to my brackets, and put a bolted connection there and, it, and eliminate this can, will that make you still force a low test, or will you take other evidence of strength, which is a new three-quarter rod embedded in the building at all the connections? 
So if you want to eliminate the load test, you change all the bolts, but the unknown into the building, what do you give me? A new Hilti. So you'll allow that? Great. On the cables, guys, you have, what don't you want to see? Fraying, brown, what's a fire, what's a, all cables go up, naked or, or galvanized? Galvanized. If it's brown and they paint it, swap it. Okay, so we have to talk, we talk about material loss. We talked about, dang, you see any rush jacking happening in any of these buildings? Any, you have any questions? You going to load test that? How long does it take to grow one inch of rust? How, what material? One quarter inch of steel will make one inch of rust. But tw in 25 years, how much rust will you average? What is the average that you will look in and see on, on a connection in 25 years? One quarter inch. Half inch takes, do the math, yeah, 50 years. So in some cases, though, you look at the bottom, but you don't look at the top, or it's reverse. That is the top, but the bottom, when you look up, it looks super tight. So rust grows like this, coming from the top, grows like this when it comes from the bottom, grows like this when it's in full separation. And the reason why you don't ever weld a fire escape is because there's a bolted connection. When it heats up and cools up, it does what? And earthquakes. As soon as you weld it, what happens? freezes it and as it grows in, so it'll try to tear that, that weld, right? So every weld out there needs a special inspection unless I do what to it? System. With what? Take a new bolt, I got a weld here and I, I did a lateral load test and it held. What else do I still do, need to do to eliminate the load test? Put a bolt through it, now it becomes the master. The new bolt, what becomes the slave? Any weld. Got it? You guys ready to go look at your stuff? Do we leave everything here? Somebody tell me. Oh yeah, question time. So for the purpose of this video, that was a reg four test. That was a reg four LA test. You guys are happy with that, right? Because they're doing it here. Once you saw some of the decking pop, that triggered. I didn't see it, it already popped. It was already there. Right. But once you saw that as you went down, that creates the so what happened is that, that this is a new hotel that was getting opened up, a retrofitted building. So a pre-existing structure being retrofitted into a hotel. They had the one here done by a local guy who kind of just eyeballed the thing. And it must be structurally sound, must be kept painted. Was it? Okay. So that guy then all of a sudden, the, the, the contractor said, hey, there's some code now in California where you need to do a structural load test so that... It kind of wafted in, you know, that load test thing. And the guy says, well, I already got a one year. And yeah, no, we need that load test. I came in, did a load test, and I, uh, and I gave them this information. That was uh, six months ago, plus. Have we been back? Did they grab a broom and... Why? So, guys, it, it, who's been holding it? Who just got the bag? Who lit it on fire? Building. Building. Right? And so, and who has to stomp it out? And whose lives get hurt? The firemen, right? First responders, the tenants. So, can we leave everything here, guys? Oh, no. Yeah. And can we go to that fire escape? Yes. Let's do it. And then right after that fire escape inspection, we're going to go, and I'm not going to inspect. You guys are going to inspect. Um... Going up there, uh, and we'll make platform. It so the first thing, 
in five on, years. On Thursday and Saturday. to satisfy OSHA, you need to have certified platforms. Is this a certified platform yes. with this evidence here? Stalling? No. So that's a five year, we'll pick that up. Whether it's wood, cement, or steel, right? And now, can I do a sprinkler test on this? So obviously this is just a, it's, it needs maintenance because this is a 25 year old structure plus minus. So I'll look it up, you want all of that verified that there's no, no possibility that this is going to collapse, right? If this was all metal, we would be looking at the structure as a metal structure, the connections into the wall and the expansion. So, but do we have some cement and wood structures out there that feed the, feed the fire? Because so sprinkling guys are first on it, who's the last guys on it? Firemen. They're the first to see it. Who's the last to see it? Fireman. Right. So now let's go. Oh. Is that an internal stair? Yeah, that's all cement. So once it goes internal, who inspects it? I do a, a building department. Into all internal stairs. IFC or IBC? It's, IBC. A, it's an IBC question. So what? If you enclose it. So as soon as you enclose this, can I inspect it anymore? Because then it'll have sprinklers and it'll have all kinds of things. Who, who, who takes it once it's enclosed? IBC. If it's exposed to the weather, IFC. So let's go over here. So obviously, uh, let's take a look at the, the fire escape itself. I think you can start down here. All galvanized. Any visible rust? Any visible rust? Like, I mean, really, look, I mean, real. No, right? Ready for load testing? Ready for load testing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's take a look at welded connections. See this welded connection up here? See all these welded connections? And is it all galvanized? And is, was this welded on site or was it shop welded field installed? Probably shop welded. So, shop welding, do they have certified welders there? Yeah. Do they have conditions that are in control? Yep. So could an engineer or an architect come and look at that and say, I have no, no tears, no nothing, any internal rust anywhere on this fire escape piece here that you can see. So ready for load testing? Yes. Yep. Perfect, right? So let's talk about the cement connection, right? Cement connection. Either I see spalling or I don't see spalling. So you see any spalling? Right. Right Ready for so routine maintenance or spalling? Spalling means no. Oh, there's a hole you can put your fist inside. Routine maintenance. So once the inspector says, hey, some minor routine maintenance, let's you know some minor patching. Ready for load testing? Yep. Perfect. So now if we step back, also I want to point out that all the, all of this hardware, it's not square head bolts. It's all all new hex head bolts. So know the difference. This is hex head, eight side. Down here. Make and that's the nut side, hex heads. Compared to squares, so we know it's fairly all recent. treads need 3 eighths. Okay? Manufactured tread and are, are homemade at the at the site. Manufactured. Non slip nose. A five year guy would pick this up and she's ready for a load test. This thing just went up five years ago. Do I need to load test five years later? No. Twenty five years from now. You need to perform a load test. If I want to eliminate my concerns about this weld, what could I do to this weld right now if this thing is 25 to 35 years old, galvanized? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. So you're gonna, it seems like you need a washer right there. there this first two pack. structural bolts on this right, side. Even right here. What about my platform? It's all it welded and it still like looks good 25 to 35 years later. That's a good question. And I'm trying to avoid the load test. So what do you do to welded fire escapes 25 to 35 years later to avoid the load test? All right, so let's put a bolt here. Every two feet, put a bolt there, put a bolt there. Now, do I care about those? Nope. Those nope. welds anymore. The the, they're not the master. The bolt is the master. So now, and then I seal and cock it from the top so water doesn't get back in. Now, this is galvanized. I don't know if you know, but galvanized will give you 40 years on average. But you know, you can put a primer on that. It's called Galvite, showed by Sherwin Williams. And then you can top coat it with any color. So a lot of times, galvanized only works when it's exposed. That's a chain link fence galvanized. If you leave it alone for 20 years, it'll turn brown. But right now, if that guy wants that thing to last 50 years, he should prime it with Galvite, which is a primer specifically only for galvanized, like there's a primer specifically for aluminum. Top coated green or whatever color he wants, he can even color it back to silver. How long will that last? It'll last 50 years. So is this fire escape ready for a paint job? Yes. 
Otherwise, as soon as you the 40 years are up, she's going to stop rusting, and then her structural integrity is going to be compromised and questioned. Now we have another concern. Out of this guy doesn't want this guy on this building with this 25 to 35 year old structure says, I don't want to load test this. Can I over here put in a big clip over here and put a through bolt, put an epoxy through bolt into this masonry block wall, eight to twelve inches deep, three quarter, but you know, epoxy it here, then bolt it back here. Is this gonna be an inside clip or I can do it in here or I can do it out here, wherever it's convenient, right? Now, do I need to load test now? So a 25 to 35 year galvanized fire escape, can I retrofit it so that I can avoid the load test for the next 15 to 25 years forward? Yes. Yeah. What about like, tenemic, what if you did like tenemic paint on the concrete? Right? Oh, that's a great one. Then. So the, yeah. everything, even tenemic, which right. by the way, you can get as high as a kite on tenemic. Yes. If you don't do it out in the open, <laughs> that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, that's the problem. It's not the covering, guys. It's the base. Everything is based on your primer. But you can use marine paint, tenemic paint. There's even a, a, a spray that, you, that sells through ACE. And it's to uh, carbonize the rust. And so that then you can apply your top coat. The key right now is your connection. If I focus on my connections of my treads and this starts rusting, that's just a paint job. You know who can do a paint job? Anybody. But as soon as the rust that's on the surface trying to find a connection inside, inside a connection and it, inter, inter, it, it hits 20, uh, 35 to 50 year paintable silicone, so it's a silicone uh, latex mix, right? Guess what happens? It can't get in the connection anymore. So you basically turn the fire escape into a maintenance scrape and paint issue in. So in your future, maybe 10 years from now, 5 to 10 years from now, you know what your violation is going to say? It's great paint. <laughs> it's great paint, but I wouldn't make that. Inspect. Repair if needed. Any repair needed? Low test or other evidence of strength. And what will every engineer who's, who's touched that fire escape for multiple years forward, well, well, what will he give you? I looked at this five years ago. I'm looking at it today. I'm giving it a pass on other evidence of strength. And he's so sure of himself that what's the likelihood of him ever going to the court on a fatality of any kind? Very small. Not because it's the internal rust. Yeah. You know what um, I'm saying? He had a question why we don't use more washers on some of these connections. First, so a lot, yeah, so the washers, uh, that was a question that came up. These holes are 3 8 holes matching 3 8 nuts, 3 8 bolts. A lot of times when you have oblongs, that's when we use nut, uh, we use washers. Yeah, you don't so need to lock it. There's no <laughs> lock washers needed. It's like over here. This See, that's what you've got like up it here. It distributes Correct. the load very well. So, what, so whenever there's an oblong hole, a lot of times the back side is going to have an, a washer because the oblong can have <laughs> a, an issue with a slip. Thank you. But there's so much redundancy here because it's all in shear. These bolts are not tearing apart this way, so you're never going to pull a bolt through the tread. Just yeah, trying to shear four okay. three-eighths bolts. Very difficult. So much so that I'll give you a three-pound hammer and I'll stop saying load these are straight down bolts. instead of right. sideways. Shear these for me. Okay. You'll pound and hurt your. If it was sideways, it would be different. Your arm and your yeah, hand. you're going trying to shear the muscle. Yeah. Trying to shear this. It's not oh, cold. It's right. It's not yeah, it's hard. It's right. Right. Go. It's too loud. I'm going to go out there. Gentlemen, from the ground, you guys do not get on fire escapes anymore. Everything can be done from the ground or open a window and look at it. And by the way, we perform uh, free load tests on all fire on all fire towers. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Obviously, the other fire escape on the other side is newer than this one because it's all welded and galvanized, and this one is a tra more traditional. So, let's take a look at it. Look at the bolts. Squares are hex heads. Right? So, you're, you're pretty comfortable with that. Galvanized or non galvanized? Galvany. Do, is it due for a paint job? More paint than rust or more rust than paint? Meaning more gal than, than rust or more, more rust than gal? So the uh, galvanized is a protectant. Now let's take a look at some of the things. If you all come this way, actually you can see this way. Oh, what are we starting to see now, guys? There it is. 
Yeah. And this is galvanized, so can I pass this Farscape today? Just on that. No. It's a minor repair, and I can look at more, right? So now let's just say, so uh, it's a five-year inspection. You are an architect or you're an engineer or an other qualified to inspect. Can I certify this? Can I this pass, no. platform pass? Let's look at it the other way, guys. Get on this side, look this way. Can I can I pass this right now? No. Nope. Nope. I was gonna ask you too. Alright, can side. I pass that one over there with the rust? Nope. nope. So what's it, it's very yeah, clear. I'll, I'll get your question in a second. Yeah. It's very clear. Is this rusting from the top down in the V, or is it rusting from the bottom up in the V? Bottom up. Bottom up. So you can you already know how rust grows. How about this connector? Can I low test that already? Nope. Are you, are you see any major rust inside of it? Nope. nope. That's nope. ready for low testing. Yeah. How about that one? Can I low test that one? Yep. How about yeah. this one?